not the only reason that we're seeing these cases go up. And he's essentially calling for testing to be ramped up even further, essentially the exact opposite of what we're hearing from the president, right? Right, and actually there are numbers we can follow locally to figure out if there's enough testing in our community. The best number to follow is your positive percentage rate. Basically, if your tests go up, but so do your positive tests, you still need more testing. So in states that have over 10% positive test rates, which is right now nine states in the union, those are the states that really need to ramp up their testing, and those are the states that pool testing probably would be good for. And as Monica just reported, we are going to hear from the coronavirus task force the first time in about two months. What are you expecting to hear today? And what do Americans really need to hear today, Dr. Cass, in order to navigate uh, the surge in cases that we're seeing in so many states nationwide? So honestly, I really want to keep it very simple. What I would love to hear from the task force is uniform acknowledgement that we are in the middle of a global pandemic and we need to continue to acknowledge public health and science. We need to remember the virus is out there. It is hitting numerous states harder than ever before. And the only way to address it is not with a vaccine or medication yet, but with public health measures like masks, social distancing when appropriate, and hand washing. And I think a uniform call to action to wear masks everywhere, especially in gatherings like rallies and protests, would be very, very helpful to hear from the White House at this point. Yeah, that would be critical information and messaging. You're absolutely right about that. Dr. Cass, the CDC is now saying that the number of Americans uh, impacted by this and infected with COVID-19 may be 10 times higher than the figures that we currently have. Do you agree with that assessment? And what do you make of that? What's the significance of that? The significance, honestly, is the acknowledgement that we just haven't had enough testing. When you think about robust testing, you realize that you can find cases that are mildly symptomatic early in their case, and even asymptomatic people that have been in contact with other people that are sicker. What we saw in New York City when we were hitting the height of our surge, our tidal wave, is that we knew patients at home that were not getting tested, that were infected, and spreading the virus to other people. And so the acknowledgement by the CDC that there may be 10 times as many people in America right now, in fact, is another complicit acknowledgement that we need to get out testing strategies and tracking strategies if we're going to keep ahead of this virus anywhere in this country. Dr. Derek Katz, really important information on a... You too. Thank you, Sandra. Okay. Tries. Well, Joe Biden ripping President Trump's handling of the pandemic. It's like a child who can't believe this has happened to him. All his whining and self-pity. Well, this pandemic didn't happen to him. It happened to all of us. The president hitting back at Biden for a big gaffe of his own. Plus, new Fox polls show Biden neck and neck with Trump in some traditionally red states. Carl Rove is here to talk about all of this just ahead, but first, President Trump last night. He is a candidate that will destroy this country. And he may not do it himself. He will be run by a radical fringe group of lunatics that will destroy our country. And people have to know that. So we have to try things differently in order to stop this because the virus isn't going anywhere until there's a vaccine and we can't have this open and shut, keep doing that. That's going to be very disruptive to businesses and to the economy. We have to get this right. And I think uh, many states did get it right, but I think that clearly not all of them did. And I think we have to rethink this, this whole approach in those states. Dr. Adelja, grateful for your insights and expertise today. And as always, thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. Thank you. And up next for us, Isa, even as we worry about the current case count, Many doctors worried about long-term effects for those we already know haven't had coronavirus. When the world gets complicated, introduce the Disarm Hate Act to do just that. If you commit a hate crime, you shouldn't be allowed to own a gun, period. We know that the civilizations as well as deaths um, and the percent positive, those are all indications in terms of the spread. One of the things we, we pointed out in our report is that we do need better data at the federal government in terms of hospitalizations, for example, uh, the number of ICU beds that are filled. And that's something we'll be continuing to track. Well, it would seem to me, you know, we had a last, about three weeks ago, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which according to my, somebody told me yesterday, is actually where they did the research and helped develop the polio vaccine. These are the experts of the experts. They said 
that uh, the virus is losing its, its potency, it's mutating to a lesser strain, which if they were having more positives, but yet less hospitalizations and less deaths, would seem to indicate that there, this could be the case. So I think this is a very important point that needs to be made uh, with regards to uh, the media is only telling you that the cases are in increasing, but it doesn't tell you that the deaths continue to go down and hospitalizations continue to go down, as well as most hospitals still have capacity to take care of that. All those factors are important. All those data points are important. I would note hospitalizations and deaths tend to lag, and so it will be important to, tr to track this in the next couple of weeks to see how, how that data changes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Chief. And the TV. VESPA and the TV. <laughs> All right. The VESPA. $3,999. The TV. Two uh, no, $2,799. To a few years ago, and oddly enough, I lost, I, I put all my stuff in a storage facility, and that storage facility caught on fire, so I actually lost the fireplace in a fire, even though it, I never really used the fireplace for a fire. Um, I present. We took our message of uh, faith, family, you know, individual responsibility and freedom, and it really resonated with a lot of people who feel very disenfranchised by how polarizing our politics are right now. Mr. Cawthorn, you are running for White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows' vacant house seat. Meadows nominated you to attend the Naval Academy, and you consider him a mentor. But it has been reported that the president endorsed your opponent at the request of Meadows' wife. Did that sting and any hard feelings? Uh, that did sting a good bit. You know, we uh, when Mark Meadows endorsed and when Senator Ted Cruz endorsed, you know, we didn't really think those would move the needle very much at all. But uh, once the president got involved, obviously that was that carries a significant amount of weight here in Western North Carolina. Uh, so, but I, you know what? Fortunately, we were able to get through it. I had a wonderful phone call with the president. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to getting to work with him. Uh, but there's no hard feelings for Congressman Meadows or his wife. He's been very good to me my whole life, and so I uh, look forward to working with him in his uh, new position as chief of staff. Well, it sounds like you're learning a lesson that if you want a friend in Washington, you have to buy a dog if you get to Congress. Uh, you know what? I actually don't think I have to buy a dog. I have probably the greatest German Shepherd on the planet named Beowulf, uh, but he's not a very good campaign puppy. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, unfortunately, a car accident in 2014 derailed your Naval Academy plans that Megan had mentioned and left you paralyzed from the waist down. How did that experience affect your outlook on life? You know what I will tell you, uh, it, it changed my whole perspective uh, quite a bit. You know, it, it taught me a level of grit and perseverance that would have taken probably decades to learn otherwise. But also it taught me something that I think is lacking a lot on the Republican side uh, in politics, and that's empathy. It's being able to, to feel like I can recognize when people feel disenfranchised or when they don't feel like the, the, the system represents them. And so I know what that's like and I, I can empathize with that. I'm just enamored by uh, young people that get involved in the political process. So kudos to you for running at, at this age. I, I think that's incredible. Um, the, the accident left you with $3 million in medical debt, which is why you plan to make health care reform one of your signature issues. And I think that's extremely admirable. Uh, you are against free health care for all. So I want to understand what is your plan, especially since we are seeing tw 20 million people quit uh, uh, will be out of work due to COVID-19. So I'm assuming your health care plan has nothing to do with employer-related insurance. Uh, no, Sonny, it does not. You know, I thank you very much for your question. But the thing that I think is so imperative to realize is that if I was in a country that practiced socialized medicine, I genuinely believe I would be dead today. Uh, you know, I, at that point, whenever you're using a... a single payer, a free base market of uh, health care that gives health care to all, you obviously have to start rationing care. And I only had about a 1% chance to live. It was an absolute miracle that I was able to pull through. You know, I think my doctors, I think my God. But, you know, I, I, I know that without having a great health care system, I would not be here today. And so my answer, though, is that, you know, for too long, the Republicans have been the party of no when it comes to health care reform. 
Whereas I really believe that we should be leading the pathway to, to lower prices so more Americans can have access to it. And I think the way to do that is to re de re decrease regulation because, you know, here in North Carolina, Blue Cross Blue Shield has a, a virtual monopoly on the entire state and that cre creates artificially high prices. But I think if we could bring in some more insurance company and bring more competition and price transparency to the entire, to the entire industry, we could see prices go significantly far lower. I mean, you know, there's six people trying to sell a pizza to my house right now that will deliver to my house, and they're all trying to get a pizza to me, you know, for as cheap as it can be, as fast as they can, and with the best taste. And, you know, I think it's a, an extremely simplified analogy, but I think it's very imperative to realize that free market capitalism works and it always lowers prices. I love that. Totally agree. Uh, Mr. Cawthorn, a win in November would make you the youngest person to serve in Congress at just 25 years old. The youngest person in Congress is the infamous Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and you two couldn't be more different. You are a hardline conservative, limited government, pro-Second Amendment, pro-life, and one of the pillars of your campaign is resisting the rise of socialism on the left. Why is that so important to you, and do you think you can go head-to-head -head with her? Uh, you know what I do? I, I will say that while her beliefs and mine are extraordinarily different, uh, she does do a great job of being able to bring young people over to her side and really to make up a lot of these undecided minds and fight for their hearts and minds. Uh, but that's something that I really want to do on in Congress myself. You know, I think the only real congressman we have trying to do that right now in the current Congress is probably Congressman Dan Crenshaw. But aside from that, you know, I think the Republicans have oftentimes struggled to bring in the young vote. And, you know, right now we have a, a, a generational time bomb that's going to go off in the Republican Party. And if it does and we're, we start losing every single election, like I, I think may happen if we don't start reaching the hearts and minds, then, you know, I think we'll see socialism rise up very, very fast. And, you know, you probably ask why I oppose that, but it's because I believe that this country is founded on individual rights. You know, we see so often that people are wanting to, you know, with the Green New Deal or with Nancy Pelosi's proposed stimulus package that failed in the Senate. Uh, I know that that is something that is nothing short of government control. It limits our ability to have private ownership of our property, and it really limits how much money we can have in our own pockets because it puts more government control on the American people. Okay. Well, we'll have more with Madison Cawthorn when we come back. Far from Vroom is so easy, all you need is a phone and a finger. Just So far, if we can keep on that trend, then we can get back to where we were just a week ago fairly quickly. But right now, let's take a, a week, 10-day pause, and let's watch those ICU numbers, and let's watch the, um, the, the fatalities. The bottom line, Sandra and, and, and Trace, to our people of Texas, they expect us to protect their life and also to protect their liberty, protect their freedom and protect their businesses and their jobs and that's a tough balancing act and that takes calm leadership that's optimistic that's based on data and moving forward so we're still moving forward with a slight pause we were ahead of everyone else and we're going to watch these numbers but going back to a lockdown that would have to be something catastrophic and we don't see that in the future Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, we appreciate you keeping us posted. Our viewers appreciate sure. that. Our best to the people of your state as you try to climb out of this. Thanks so much. Come back soon. Thank you. We're always going to lead in Texas. Thank you, sir. Communication internally uh, for them not to uh, release this information to the community. As a matter of fact, uh, I put at the table for my colleagues on the council to immediately uh, do a very quick reform related to this, which is any in-custody death at the hands of TPD uh, must be released to the community and mayor and council within the first 24 hours. We do this already with officer-involved shootings, and we could do the same with situations of in-custody death. It, it has to be done. Your Tucson police chief offered his resignation this week. Last night, the family member said very clearly into that microphone, we do not want him to resign and run away from the job. They want accountability. They want action within the department. Should the police chief resign, and what needs to happen inside your department? I agree with the family. I believe that um, we have to work together on reforming um, any aspect of uh, policing in our community uh, for the benefit of 
uh, transparency and accountability in, in for two zonings. So I agree with the family. Uh, they were very clear with me and the city manager of the city of Tucson. We do not want him to uh, resign. We want him to work with us, with you as mayor, uh, so that we can shepherd in the reform that is necessary. And right now it's about reform, but also reconciliation with the community. The community is, uh, is mad and uh, rightfully so. So we have to make sure that, that, uh, that we take action steps together uh, to overcome this unfortunate and serious event. Tucson is known as being the progressive city of Arizona. You're a progressive mayoral's office, progressive police chief. That's always been the word here out of Tucson. I heard calls last night from the family members who were also accompanied by Black Lives Matter leaders mm -hmm. saying that the, the police budget should be reapportioned out mm -hmm. to other areas. What does the police budget look like in the future? What I uh, believe is that we need to reimagine how we serve our community. Uh, not every call deserves a cop with a gun. And so we have to make sure that we continue funding social services that, um, that affect families. And so first and foremost, we have to really realize as a community, as a state, and, a, and, and as a country, that we have been defunding social services, mental health, drug dependency specialists. Uh, we don't have enough affordable housing. We have to refund um, programs that help prevent uh, the space where Carlos and his family found themselves when they called for help and they called 911. Mayor, I, Mayor, thank you Mayor, so much. This Mayor, conversation really will continue it. here in these days ahead. We thank appreciate you. your time. Kristen, Carlos Adrian Ingram Lopez is now dead. The father, the question marks here in the city are where does this police department go from here and how does the community mourn the loss of one of their own? Bud Hilliard, really important conversation there with the mayor of Tucson at a very difficult time for that community. Vaughn, thank you for that. Coming up next, we will have more on. Then I found pro back. It's Rio. Shows him trailing Democrat Joe Biden. With me now to discuss Julie Hirschfeld Davis of the New York Times, CNN, Vivian Salama. Julie, it's doing this is risky anyway. If you look at the president's poll numbers in these battleground states, it adds to the risk. Uh, just a few numbers. Obamacare enrollment is up 46% January to May 2020 in the middle of the pandemic compared to 19. More people are relying on this program as they are stressed in health care because of the pandemic. And then if you ask voters, favorable or unfavorable of Obamacare, 56% have a favorable opinion right now. That's nearly 6 in 10 Americans have a favorable opinion. And when you ask keep Obamacare, make minor changes, or get rid of it, 58% support the idea of keep it and fix it. The president is taking a giant gamble here a couple months before an election. He is, and, and if you look at some of the numbers, I mean, as you said, Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act, is popular. People, by and large, do want to keep it and change what may not be working so well um, for some of them. but. Uh, the problem for Republicans and for President Trump is that they really haven't made a case for what they would do instead, and that's part of the right. issue here. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is going to bring up a bill next week to expand the Affordable Care Act, and uh, they're going to tell voters exactly what they would do to improve uh, the, the law as it is now. And Republicans, although they've talked about repealing and replacing it, really haven't um, put anything forward uh, as to what they would do. And the contrast is going to be quite stark, given that the administration is pushing forward on this uh, so close to an election, and as you said, there are many uh, vulnerable Republicans who are going to have to answer for that in their own campaigns. And, and so, Vivian, the president was asked that question flatly last night, what's your top priority in a second term? And he didn't really have a good answer. He said he'd have more experience uh, if he got a second term. Uh, listen, in contrast, uh, the former Vice President Joe Biden says, elect me president and I will fix your health care. By guaranteeing that no American ever has to spend more than 8.5% their income on health insurance and that number will be lower for lower income people we're also going to further reduce costs by making it less expensive for americans to choose plans with lower deductibles and out-of-pocket expenses i guess you could applaud the president for sticking to his principles here he said all along he wanted to abolish obamacare in the first two years when he had an all republican washington they failed flatly failed to repeal and replace uh, but this would seem to be a gift to Joe Biden at a time the president's already struggling. 
And timing is everything, right, John? And this week, the government said that close to half a million Americans who had lost their health care coverage in the midst of the coronavirus economic downturn went for coverage on healthcare.gov. And so you see that there is a need right now for something like this. Not only that, there's a lot of talk about what would happen to people with pre-existing conditions. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And technically, and Joe Biden was arguing this just yesterday, people with coronavirus would be considered people with pre-existing conditions. And so should the Supreme Court hear this case in the fall and decide to overturn Obamacare, then people with coronavirus would right, likely lose their health care or potentially could lose their health care. And so Again, timing is everything. Obamacare has come under a lot of scrutiny. Obviously, health care was a major issue of debate among Democrats during the primaries. They say that it's not perfect and it needs to be worked out. But right now, Joe Biden is talking about keeping Americans insured at a time of great uncertainty and a time where so many people are vulnerable to uh, this pandemic. And so another big issue I want to get you both of you weighed in on is this whole idea that because of the pandemic, more and more states are going to have mail-in balloting. It's just inevitable more and more states are doing this. Democratic states, Republican states, they're doing it. Uh, the president doesn't like it, but I want you to listen to the lead, of course, plus or minus three points, well within the margin of error. But, but is there something here that surprises you when it comes to who would do a better job, Carl? Not really. I mean, I think the coronavirus and race issues are difficult for the president to deal with. One, because he's the president and Biden is nowhere to be seen on these issues except when he wants to surface. So Biden can pick and choose the moments that he comes forward. The president can't. Uh, though, let's step back. This is part of a broader drama. And if you take a look not only at the Fox polls, but the New York Times polls, uh, in key battleground states, the president in many of those states is behind. Uh, and in some states, it's close and within the margin of error, as you say. But let's be honest about it. The president is behind today. All, of you, all the national polls suggest that he's behind. Real clear politics average is now close to nine points. Six weeks ago, it was, it was five. Now, these things happen in campaigns. In May of 20, actually, May of 1988, George Herbert Walker Bush was behind Michael Dukakis by 19 points and won by nearly, by nearly eight. In 1948, August of 1948, Harry S. Truman, the incumbent president, was behind Tom Dewey by nine points in late August, causing Clark Clifford to, to write the famous memo on charting a strategy forward to him. So the question is not where are the polls today, but what does the president need to do in order to regain the advantage? And remember, he's got some powerful tools. He is the president, and all these polls show that on the issue that tends to be number one in a campaign, namely the economy, he still has a... Uh, an advantage, but he's got to do, in my opinion, three things. What does he want to do next? No president gets reelected by simply saying, I've done a good job. So the last night he was asked this question by Sean Hannity, he needs to get a better answer. But this is the most important thing. The second most important thing, what are the big choices that he wants to make this issue about? Things on which he can contrast himself with, with uh, Joe Biden. And the least important, but still important, is what are the Biden weaknesses that he ought to exploit? Things like the statements that he's made about China, his weaknesses on China policy, for example. But you can't win unless you've got a disciplined, focused campaign strategy. And these polls point to the president and his team needing to, to, to re-examine what they're doing and come up with a better game plan. Was that the crux of the problem? Uh, it was a combination of things. First, I don't think he took the pandemic seriously enough. I think he was of the mind of Donald Trump that uh, that was a kind of a see no evil, hear no evil approach. So Texas uh, was very slow to test people, to trace the infections, and then to treat people. And so when you combine an early opening uh, and lack of days of work on those other things, plus what the governor did in the middle of the pandemic is first he said, hey, local governments, you all make the tough decisions about all of this, uh, and I'm just gonna sit back and watch what happens. Mm. And then after that, at a certain point, when the folks on his right, the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick uh, and other folks started jumping all over him because of that, what he did was he said, hey, I'm gonna take control now from the local governments, and I'm gonna say that you can't have people, you can't have an ordinance that says people have to wear a mask, for example. So he's flip-flopped a million times on this, uh, and it really has just caused chaos in Texas. And you can see that the numbers are skyrocketing, and the situation is getting very, very scary in my home state. What? Grand Falls favorites are back in action. So when you... You apply it evenly, and then it will buff and blend the... Tristan, this one's for you. 
alive. No way. Nein, nein. And for spreading the word across America about what we're fighting for. Uh, we're on a historic march for statehood. Uh, we know that the district becoming the 51st state is the only way uh, that 700,000 taxpaying Americans are fully represented uh, and become full Americans. Uh, and that's why we are fighting for statehood for D.C. How frustrating is it that Mitch McConnell won't even bring it to the floor? Uh, well, it's, it's very frustrating. Uh, we've answered all of the questions that have been uh, lobbed against us about uh, statehood. And now all that is left is that the issue of whether Americans should be represented in the Congress who pay taxes uh, is a partisan issue, Democrat versus Republican. Um, but that's not really the, the question that the members should be asking themselves. They should be asking themselves what is fair uh, and what what reflects the principles of the American democracy? D.C. residents being the, the only people in the free world whose capital city residents aren't represented in the capital is simply anti-American. And in fact, it's been since 1801, the last time D.C. residents were able to vote. Uh, you've been pointing out that D.C. residents pay more in taxes per capita than anyone else in the country. Right, and so sometimes people are confused about uh, who we are and uh, how we operate in Washington, D.C., and what the Constitution requires. The bill that's before the House of Representatives continues to have a nation's capital, a federal enclave that is required by uh, the Constitution of the United States. But the balance of the current District of Columbia, where over 700,000 people live, um, becomes the 51st state. Our population is already greater than that of two states. Bigger, we're bigger than Wyoming and Vermont. Uh, and unlike uh, the territories, which some, uh, which we've been compared to recently, uh, we pay all of the federal taxes that every American pays in, in the 50 states. So when you see in taxation without representation on our license plates, because we're literally paying more than 22 states, more per capita than any jurisdiction, giving more to the federal government than we get back. Uh, we're literally being taxed without being represented. Our Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton has been fighting this fight uh, to get a vote in the House of Representatives. But currently, we do not have anybody speaking for us in the Senate. And getting two senators and being fully autonomous is what statehood means for Washington, D.C. Would land be taken from the neighboring states, from Virginia and Maryland, in this new conception of a 51st state? Absolutely not. Um, so the, the current District of Columbia in the Admission Act, um, is there is a section um, that is the federal enclave that includes the, the White House, the Capitol, Supreme Court, the National Mall, all the Smithsonian's. So the people um, from um, across America will still come to their nation's capital. Uh, and the balance of the current District of Columbia becomes the 51st state. Now, you tweeted today that the color of your skin shouldn't determine whether you can vote. I'm paraphrasing there. Do you think that there is a racial reason for this, for the, for the district being well, uh, there is, with yes. us, uh, without a vote? Well, we know the earliest discussions among uh, the framers in the District of Columbia are related to slavery. Uh, and we know that race has has accompanied this discussion uh, throughout. Uh, you know, everybody knows that we are proud of our rich and diverse history in the District of Columbia. Uh, African Americans, people of color, and people of all backgrounds call D.C. home. Uh, and we should not, uh, people should not look to us and say that we're too urban, we're too black, we're too liberal, um, and that makes us different uh, from the people of the other American states. And we have to justify our American citizenship and representation. Uh, that's That hasn't been the case for any um, state being added to the union, and it shouldn't be the case for us. Now, this certainly came as a fair reading of this. 
I would encourage everyone on this subject to read Tim Alberta's new piece um, about a visit that he made to an upper middle class African American neighborhood outside of Detroit and the conversations that he had with black Americans there. They were expressing a lot of the same sentiments that Mr. Johnson was. They weren't saying that there should be a BLM party, but they were saying we're going to turn up to vote, but we don't necessarily love Joe Biden. And frankly, when Obama picked him, we know that that was a choice that he made because he thought that he needed an older white man on the ticket to make him more palatable to wide swaths of Americans. So there is certainly a risk that we could see what happened again right. in 2016 when Hillary Clinton's right. number with black voters went down from Obama's in 2008 and 2012. Mm -hmm. And Democrats certainly need to heed these kinds of warnings. But I don't think a third party is something that could even feasibly happen as per Speaker Gingrich's comments or something that Democratic yeah. leadership is concerned about. Melissa, really quickly though, I, I, I bring this up all the time, but I think that progressive corporations, the bluest of liberal corporations, need to be held accountable for talking about one thing about equality and hiring so few black individuals. And I'm talking about the biggest technology companies in this country. Blacks are underrepresented at Apple at Google, at Facebook, in technical jobs, one, one and a half percent of the technical jobs at Facebook are represented by black individuals. Yes, absolutely. And I gave you the stats that we have a record number of black women sitting in mayor's seats around the country. Guess what? Only one percent of Silicon Valley is filled with black women. Thank you, Melissa. The White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing set to begin any moment now. We'll take you there live as some state go. You can't simulate it. Uh, so what can you do to prepare yourself that this is going to be weird? You know, you're going to throw a great pitch and it's going to be silence. Uh, how do you prepare for that? <laughs> you know, it's going to be it's going to be unique. Um, you know, what was normal? You know, now this is the normal. How long this will be normal? We don't know. Right. But. For me, I think uh, it's where my game comes from, right? If my game is kind of dependent on the stand or the fans or the location, you know, there's something inside that I really need to, to get out of myself that I maybe need to, you know, do a little soul searching. In. But um, my game, you know, shouldn't change on location. It shouldn't matter if it's in Detroit, Boston, Toledo, or on the moon, right? My game is inherent inside of me. It's my game. So I kind of think it'll be a new challenge if there are no fans there, which probably to start the year there won't be. It'll just be baseball in its purest form. It'll be like in the backyard flipping a wiffle ball to our teammates, right? Like to our friends back in the day. So it'll be, uh, it's just going to be, you know, the game kind of cut down to its raw form, and I'm excited about that. Matthew Boyd, I'm grateful for your time today. I wish you the best of luck, and I hope everything works out, and I'll be rooting for you, except when you're pitching against the Red Sox. How about that? <laughs> well, that sounds fine. Thanks for having me on, Mr. King. But best of luck. Best of luck. Please take care. Still ahead for us, the White House Coronavirus Task Force just moments away from holding its first public briefing in nearly two months. The prosecutor investigating the president fired. Not the Washington way. And he's doing it again. Renewing, restoring, rebuilding. 2.5 million new jobs. The biggest jobs increase ever. And he's just getting started. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. The temper Pete breeze makes... With the president uh, apparently not coming, unless he's a surprise visitor here, it's not at the White House. They haven't been seen since April 27th. We haven't seen uh, Tony Fauci at one of these public briefings since April 22nd. But what do you expect this, at this time, and why do you think they're doing it? Well, I think that the pressure just became too great, Andrea. The fact that you have cases spiking all across the country, the task force needed to address the public and needs to lay out what the next steps are and what the administration plans to do about it. It is striking. We have not seen the task force in two months. We're not expecting President Trump uh, to appear at this briefing. And take note, Andrea, it's not happening at the White House. It's happening at HHS. And so this is an attempt to really walk this fine line between acknowledging that something has shifted and something has changed and yet we know President Trump has really wanted to turn the page on all of this. He wants to focus on the economy. He wants to focus on his re-election campaign and yet his response to this crisis, Andrea, is part of why we are seeing former Vice President Joe Biden topping him in the polls uh, nationally, at least it's part of the equation, and also in some key battleground states. Now, uh, Monica Alba, Carol Lee and I have been talking to members of the 
the task force who have privately said for weeks now, Andrea, that they want to be addressing the public. They think it's important that they're getting information out. And again, the pressure at this point just too great. And Chet Todd. Gentleman reserves, gentlewoman from North Carolina, he's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll reserve. Gentlewoman from North Carolina Reserve. There's never been a thing like this. We've done 30 million, almost, we'll be there probably today or tomorrow, 30 million tests. And when you do tests, you have cases. But what they don't say is there are fewer deaths than there have been, way, way down. And our mortality rate is among the best countries in the world, meaning people that die. Because a lot of these tests, it's a case, it's a kid doesn't even know. In some cases, it's people that didn't even know they were sick. Maybe they weren't, but it shows up in a test. So they'll say 30 million tests. Now you have a big percentage of that. But other countries do very few tests. So it shows they have very few cases. And sometimes I jokingly say, or sarcastically say, if we didn't do tests, we'd look great. We're but you know what? It's not the right thing to do. President Trump last night at that Fox News town hall. Uh, we're asking this morning on the Washington Journal what your top news story of this past week was. Give us a call, let us know what you think, or uh, send us a, a tweet or a text message uh, like Jeffrey did out of Georgia saying, as a Georgian, the story of the week is that the General Assembly here passed a hate crimes bill. The sad reality is that it took the death of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd to get that law passed. We're waiting for the governor to sign it. Rob, in New York City, Democrat, what do you think the top story of the week was? Well, you know, what I wrote down for the top story, and I just had a thought in my head for some reason, that um, the people are always, Trump is always bragging that he takes a dollar a year salary. But Warren Buffett, I believe, has given away 90% of his total assets, given away 90% of his total assets to, uh, and largely to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So to take it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's ridiculous to brag about giving to taking a dollar a year what the salary is one seventy five or two and a quarter and giving away a couple hundred thousand dollars a year it's nothing. Warren Buffett has given away billions, I think hundreds of billions or ninety billion or some. Anyway, that's not the, uh, you know with the uh, with the coronavirus uh, becoming um, getting seemingly. Now, the, the hospitals are near capacity in many southern states, many Republican states, uh, and it's becoming a crisis. And it occurred to me that our, our president is not really capable of doing the work as president. Uh, he, I think he, his brain is not wired for doing the work. He's, he, his, his brain is more wired for making up falsehoods, and I think he takes the, the easy way out. I think he's a master at pretending that he can do the work, but he can't do the work. And I think it's it's a big stage act. I think it's a big TV reality show when we have... Rob, do you think uh, that, that the president's task force can do the work? Do you, do you trust uh, Dr. Redfield, Dr. Fauci, uh, the vice president's work on the, the task force? How do you think the, the president has, has handled the coronavirus pandemic when it comes to the people that he's appointed to these positions? You know, um, I like Dr. Fauci, but he doesn't speak simply and direct. He doesn't talk simply and directly to the American people. It's always like a double sort of meaning to please Trump. And so it's frustrating. You know, you hear people on some of the other stations. I had a a Republican friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, who said to me recently in a phone conversation that he doesn't hear anything on the TV anymore about the coronavirus. And I realized he's glued to Fox television. And I said to my friend, you know, I said, you really ought to turn on CNN for, you know, a half hour, an hour. And it's amazing the lopsidedness. If you'll allow me one more quick thing, I am an experienced insurance investigator. And I work for um, close to 40 years in New York City. And I am a liberal, pro-police, Democrat. Uh, all this talk about liberal Democrats being against police, I am pro-police. I have had friends on the force. And in my investigations, there are a lot of ex-police officers that, and oddly, ex-convicts who work as bouncers in bars 
and clubs throughout New York City, and I have been the liability investigator for decades to come in and find out after there's an incident, and there's quite often the case that some of the liability, some of the fights that I've investigated over the years has been the result of the tempers out of control on the part of the bouncers, which make, again, there's ex-cops and there's ex-cons that work side by side sometimes in the same clubs. That's why I think that George Floyd, I'm sorry, if I got his name, I'm sorry, Rick the Floyd. fella that was, um, that, that I believe they worked in the same club. I'm sure they knew each other and I'm sure there was some tension there. But I have coached bouncers, again, ex-cops, and ex-cons, that your job is not necessarily to stand at the front door of the bar and check the IDs of the pretty girls or whatever. That's not the job. The job is not to do the light stuff. The job, I have, and I can't tell you how many people have responded to me and told me, I've never been told this before, but what I've told them is that your job begins when the clients, when the customers, when the, when the tensions rise from alcohol or whatever, your job is to come in and calm the people down, not to become, because a, 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 a drunk customer might use the N-word, might go crazy on the bouncer. And then there's been countless times, investigations that I've had, again, close to 40 years. And Rob, do you feel like the, the training's not there or there when it comes to de-escalation tactics? And I have... I have told dozens of people when I've had the time, sometimes I'm doing a slip and fall accident, I have the time, sometimes it's about a fight and I'm talking to a, a, a bouncer who kept his cool, again, it could be an ex-cop, it could be an ex-con, to that is the time when, they, when the customer comes up and gets up in your face and starts to get, starts to get crazy on you. And it, it, often it's just verbal, you know, stuff that can be de-escalated. Oh. Rob, in New York City this morning, uh, Rob started by talking about uh, the coronavirus uh, and uh, the president's task force. Here's a, a little bit more from access across the rural communities in the United States. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it, another big problem we had here in the Northeast, and I'm trying to go through sort of some of the lessons that we learned because we were hit so hard by this. Our governor again took, I think it was seven weeks before he actually cleaned the subways and shut them down for like a real cleaning, which was one of the main ways that this disease was traveling. Um, I don't know that other cities have that same kind of vulnerability. They should create a streamlined process to help to I'm available at cspan.org. Here on a little bit more from access across the rural communities in the United States. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it, another big problem we had here in the Northeast, and I'm trying to go through sort of some of the lessons that we learned because we were hit so hard by this. Our governor, again, took, I think it was seven weeks before he actually cleaned the subways and shut them down for like a real cleaning, which was one of the main ways that this disease was traveling. Um, I don't know that other cities have that same kind of vulnerability. They should create a streamlined process to help the... I'm available at cspan.org. Here on C-SPAN 2, we'll take you live now to the Health and Human Services Department for live coverage of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. It's their first briefing in nearly two months. Well, good afternoon and to our, our fellow Americans out west, good morning. We just completed today's uh, meeting of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, and I'm pleased to be joined by many members of the task force uh, with us for this briefing. Uh, I want to thank Secretary uh, Azar, Dr. Burks, and Dr. Fauci, Dr. Redfield at the CDC, as well as our Attorney General, uh, Dr. Uh, Girard of the U.S. Public Health Service, and Dr. Hahn and Seema Verma. Uh, we'll make a series of presentations to update the American people. Uh, on the status of the coronavirus, we'll take questions, uh, but we uh, very much appreciate uh, the attendance of all who are here and all of you who have made time to tune in. The attendance of all who are here and all of you who have 
made time to tune in. As we were reported today, we have now more than 2,500,000 Americans that have contracted the coronavirus. And sadly, we've lost more than 126,000 of our countrymen to this disease. And I know I speak for the president and for every American when we express our sympathies and our deepest condolences to all the families who have lost loved ones. Despite those losses, um, uh, since the end of our 45 days to slow the spread and the beginning of efforts to open up America, uh, thanks to the cooperation of the American people, the efforts of, under the leadership of uh, President Trump, uh, we have uh, made a truly remarkable progress in moving our nation forward. We've all seen the encouraging news as we open up America again, more than three million jobs created in the last job report. Retail sales are rolling. Uh, and of course, the extraordinary progress in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and New Orleans, uh, areas that uh, just a matter of, uh, of uh, a month ago uh, were struggling under the weight uh, of this pandemic. Areas that uh, just a matter of, uh, of uh, a month ago uh, were struggling about fun. Saving money and your 50 states and territories across this country are are opening up uh, safely and responsibly. But uh, with cases rising, particularly over the past week uh, throughout the South, President Trump uh, directed our task force to brief the American people uh, on several topics. First, we, we want to share with you, as Dr. Burks will, uh, what we're seeing in the rise of new cases that uh, today surmounted 40,000 uh, new cases in a single day. Uh, secondly, we want to speak about what we've done and what we are doing at the federal level to support the state efforts, particularly in the states where we see rising cases. But we'll talk today about, about how this moment in the coronavirus pandemic is different uh, than what we saw two months ago. Uh, to better equip the American people uh, to respond. And ultimately, we will speak about what every American can do to play their part uh, in, uh, in reducing the spread and the impacts of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, for our part, also, I've, I've spoken to governors in uh, Arizona uh, and, and Florida and Texas in the last 12 hours. And Dr. Burks and I will be traveling on Sunday to Texas, uh, uh, on Tuesday to uh, Arizona, and on and to Florida uh, on, uh, on uh, Thursday of next week to get a ground report. And of course, on, uh, on Monday, we will uh, conduct what will be our 26th uh, weekly call with the entire White House Coronavirus Task Force uh, and all of the nation's governors as we, uh, as we meet this moment. As I mentioned, um, it's important uh, gathering, uh, gathering today, I think, that we take, uh, take a step back and think about how far we've come. For us. He said we had one mission, and that was to save lives. And President Trump's decision to suspend all travel from China in January to stand up the White House Coronavirus Task Force, in February to declare a national emergency to halt travel from Europe, and amend travel from other places around the country, all contributed to um, giving our nation time to stand up a broad-based response, uh, the whole of government response that uh, we spoke about so many times uh, at the podium throughout this pandemic. Um, we at the State Department also coordinated the repatriation of 95,000 Americans. And then came the moment when we brought this chart to the President of the United States uh, on the counsel of our very best scientists. And then came the moment when we brought this chart to the President of the United States uh, on the counsel of our very best scientists. Uh, the President was presented with a decision uh, that if we did nothing, no intervention, the possibility existed at that moment in time that we could lose between 1.5 million and 2.2 million Americans. But with 
intervention and with mitigation. By calling on the American people uh, to embrace the, the mitigation efforts, social distancing, uh, that were called upon first in the 15 days to slow the spread, that would become 45 days to slow the spread. Uh, our best scientists uh, believe that we could, we could reduce the number of American fatalities to a number ranging between 100,000 and 240,000. Uh, the President made that decision, uh, and uh, we unveiled the uh, 15 days that became the 45 days to slow the spread. And uh, inarguably, as we see where we are today as a nation, because of what the American people have done, because of the incredible work of our health care workers, because of a partnership with governors in every state. We did just that. We slowed the spread. We flattened the curve. We saved lives. In the midst of that, we exponentially scaled testing capacity, partnering with private sector uh, commercial laboratories. Uh, uh, we've, we've now reached uh, some 30 million tests across the country, conducting some 500,000 tests a day. In that partnership with governors also, the president directed us to make sure that states had what they needed Congrats. when they needed it. And uh, at this point, I'm pleased to report that, the, that the, the federal government both delivered and facilitated the delivery of billions of supplies of, of face shields and gowns and gloves and masks. They confirmed to me again what FEMA's reported. Uh, we have no outstanding request from any state at this time for personal protective equipment or medical supplies. Let me say that again. In the affected areas, particularly the states down south that are seeing rising cases, we have no outstanding requests. But as I told the governors, we are ready at a moment's notice to surge personnel, to surge supplies, to expand capacity and to support uh, their health care response. That, I think it always bears saying that because of uh, the great work of our health care workers and because of American manufacturing, no American who required a ventilator has ever been denied a ventilator in the United States. And uh, I, I consider that nothing short of a national accomplishment. We also surged hospital capacity in areas of the greatest anticipated need. We sent military and National Guard uh, personnel. Uh, and. Uh, these charts showing the progress that we've made in New York and New Jersey and uh, New Orleans all demonstrate the, the efforts of the people of those states in cooperation with federal government and all the great health care workers to show the progress that we made in areas that were once deeply impacted. Uh, and we extend our thanks. Uh, we extend our thanks to the people of each of those states for the sacrifices uh, that they made during those great and challenging times. But at the close of that 45 days to slow the spread, we unveiled a plan to um, uh, safely reopen America again. And now all 50 states and territories are moving forward. And as I said, we're seeing America go back to work. And in much of the country, we're, uh, we're seeing uh, jobs expanding and economic activity expanding. But our focus today is very much on, on uh, the advent of a rising series of new cases across the American South. Um, and, uh, uh, but where our first mission was to save lives, once we came out of the 45 days to slow the spread, uh, what our task force has been focused on over the course of the past two months is to partner with states to uh, save lives and safely reopen. In fact, we've, uh, uh, we've had uh, some 17 meetings of the White House Coronavirus Task Force in the intervening days since we began the process of opening up America again, and uh, we've been working very closely with states uh, to move that agenda forward. But as the President's made clear, we, we want to open our economy up. And we want to move America forward, even while we take and continue to take the steps necessary to protect lives and the health of the American people. Take and continue to take the steps necessary to protect lives and the health of the American people. We stand here today because with the, with the rising cases among southern states, President Trump asked us to brief the American people 
to give details on what we're seeing, what we're doing, uh, and how it's different from two months ago. As you may recall, after seeing overall cases drop from a 30,000 a day average in April to 25,000 a day of average in May, the first few weeks of June actually saw cases averaging roughly 20,000 new cases a day. We now have seen cases begin to rise precipitously across the South. Um, in fact, um, 34 states, uh, 34, uh, let me make sure I've got my numbers exactly right here. As we reported early on, 34 states across the country, though, uh, are experiencing a measure of uh, stability that is a credit to all of the people of those states. And when we speak about uh, stability, we are talking about not necessarily states where there are no new cases, but these would be states where there are either no new cases and no rising percentage or no combination of those two things. There may be states across the country that are seeing a modest increase in cases, but their percentage of positive rates is remaining very stable. And, um, but nevertheless, there are 16 states with rising cases and rising percentages. Uh, and uh, we'll be focusing on those states today. The first thing we'd share with the American people is that uh, while there is a, a penchant um, in, in the national debate to use a broad brush and to, uh, to paint an entire state one color if there are rising cases in a portion of the state, this is actually a better picture of the data that we literally analyze uh, every single day. Dr. Burks will take a few moments uh, to uh, unpack uh, the specific outbreaks in Texas, Florida, Arizona, and California. But the first thing we would convey uh, to the American people is that um, from this uh, new positive results in the last three days, you can see the, the concentration of new cases in specific parts of states, and of course, uh, very specifically in parts of countries, or parts of the country. Secondly, uh, we want the American people to understand it. it's almost inarguable that more testing is generating more cases. To one extent or another, the volume of new cases coming in uh, is a reflection of a, of a great uh, success in expanding testing across the country. As I said at the top, we're testing more than uh, ever before, some 500,000 uh, people a day, and perhaps we could go to that testing chart if it's there, just to show you the acceleration uh, of testing that's taken place over the course uh, of this pandemic uh, in the United States. It's truly been a private partnership uh, from, from the very outset. One of the things that we're seeing among the cases, and we hear this in Florida, we hear this in Texas and elsewhere, is that roughly half of the new cases are Americans under the age of 35, uh, which, um, which is, at a certain level, very encouraging news, as the experts tell us. Because as we know so far in this pandemic, that younger Americans are less susceptible to serious outcomes of the coronavirus. And um, the fact that we are finding more younger Americans who've contracted the coronavirus uh, is a good thing. And so we'll, um, we'll speak about the testing, and Admiral Brett Girard is here uh, and can detail any questions that you might have about testing going forward. Um, thirdly, we'll, we'll talk about um, what, these, uh, what these new numbers mean and how we can address them. And Dr. Fauci will speak about that in just a moment, particularly in the affected areas. And uh, the other area that we spend a great deal of time thinking about is, uh, is hospitalization. Not only do we track new cases every day on a county by county basis, but we also track a hospitalization. And uh, the, the map on the left of your screen represents how um, to inpatient coronavirus cases over the last 14 days. The map on the right uh, shows care workers have the resources and support they need. Again, as in, the, as in the matter of new cases, you can also see with hospitalization, it's highly focused, uh, highly detailed, uh, and highly specific. Um, 
Secretary Azar will speak about um, hospitalization, the work of HHS to make sure that uh, our hospitals around the country have the capacity to meet this moment. Uh, but uh, as Dr. Burks may well reflect as well, we are encouraged that where two months ago we were seeing some 15% uh, of new cases uh, being hospitalized, now that number is averaging roughly 5% uh, around the country, which is also encouraging news uh, to say the least. And so uh, the um, uh, while we, uh, while we have 16 states that we're focusing on, again, I would just reiterate to the American people, the most useful thing to know is where it's happening so that you can take the steps necessary to do your part. But rest assured, in our conversations uh, with governors in all of the most impacted states, uh, we continue to be assured that hospital capacity remains strong, uh, and they know the federal government stands ready uh, to provide them with personal protective equipment or supplies or even expanded capacity and personnel to meet uh, any moment. Uh, but uh, at this point in time, we are told that, uh, that in, in all of the states most deeply impacted, that hospitalization uh, remains very, very broadly available. Uh, finally, I want to speak about um, the progress that uh, we've made as a country on the most difficult aspect of this. I said at the beginning uh, that our hearts and our prayers uh, go out to the families who've lost loved ones in the course of the coronavirus pandemic. And I, I know I speak on behalf of, of everyone in this country when I, I, I extend our sympathies to the more than 126,000 families that have lost loved ones. As the President has said many times, one life lost is too many. Um, but. Uh, but nevertheless, we, uh, I believe at this point in the course of the pandemic, um, we can still take some comfort in the fact that uh, fatalities are declining all across the country. There literally was a, uh, a day two months ago this week where we lost 2,500 Americans in a single day. This week, uh, because of the extraordinary work of our healthcare workers, because of the availability of new medicines like remdesivir, new treatments like steroids, and because of the cooperation of the American people, heeding the guidance that we gave at the federal level, and state and local officials gave. This week, uh, there were two days where we lost less than 300 Americans. And you can see from this chart uh, what has been a precipitous decline from some of the worst moments of this pandemic as it impacted areas of New York and New Jersey and the Northeast. Again, uh, I, I have a heavy heart anytime I recite these numbers, but, uh, but the fact that we are making progress, uh, reducing the number of Americans that we have lost and are losing, uh, I hope is an encouragement. Because as we see new cases rising and we're tracking them very carefully, there may be a tendency among the American people to think that we are we are back to that place that we were two months ago, that, uh, that we're in a time of, of great losses and, um, and great hardship on the American people. The reality is we're in a much better place with the, with the efforts President Trump mobilized at the federal level, with the efforts of this team, this whole of government approach, the efforts of governors across the country, our incredible healthcare workers, and the cooperation of the American people. Um, we're in a much stronger place. The truth is we did slow the spread. We flattened the curve. We were able to stand up the resources and the capacities in our health care system to be able to meet this coronavirus uh, in a way that would put um, the health of all of our country first. Uh, we've also, we also cared for the most vulnerable and continue to focus resources and testing and supplies on the most vulnerable, seniors with serious underlying conditions. And I too believe with all my heart that we've continued uh, to save resources and testing and supplies on the most vulnerable seniors with serious underlying conditions. And I too believe with all my heart that we've continued uh, to save lives. We've created a solid foundation for whatever challenges come, either in the days ahead or in the months ahead. And that's a credit. That's a credit, I believe, to our president, to our federal team, to our state partners 
but mostly it's a credit to the American people and our health care workers. And so uh, we stand here today, we believe we've made progress, uh, but as we are reminded as we see cases rising uh, across the South, uh, that uh, we still have work to do. <clears throat> and so we say to uh, every American, particularly those in counties and in states that are being impacted by rising cases, uh, that uh, now's the time for everybody to continue to do their part. And I think you'll hear from this podium today a particular message to younger Americans, younger Americans across the Sun Belt, and the role that you can play in protecting the vulnerable, and making sure that while the coronavirus doesn't represent as significant a threat for a serious outcome to a younger American, none of us would want to um, bring the disease back to our parents or grandparents, moms and dads, and an elderly friend or a, a friend who has a, an immunodeficiency and cause a serious outcome as well. And so we leave you just with the guidelines for all of the phases. When we put out the guidelines to open up America again, um, we laid out at, at, uh, at uh, the outset um, guidance for responsible reopening and states across the country as I mentioned are doing just that. 34 states are reopening safely and responsibly and seeing uh, low and uh, steady cases and not seeing a rise uh, in the percentage of positives. And in the 16 uh, states that are being impacted, particularly those that we'll focus on here today, uh, we would just encourage every American to follow the guidelines for all the phases. Continue to practice good hygiene, wash your hands, avoid touching your face, uh, disinfect frequently. Um, uh, people who feel sick should stay home and when it comes to businesses, uh, social distancing, protective equipment, temperature checks, testing and isolation. Um, these are the guidelines for all of the phases uh, and they are good. You saw illustrated in those charts and places like New York and New Jersey, Connecticut and New Orleans was, uh, was a result of the, of the American people stepping forward, heeding the guidance of, of federal, state and local authorities. And we encourage you to continue to do just that. Uh, at home and at work and in your community. Um, but uh, for those in the areas most affected, we just want to encourage you uh, to listen to and respect the guidance of your state uh, and local authorities. Uh, recognize that this is different than two months ago, both in our ability to respond uh, and in the nature of those that are being infected and that younger Americans have a particular responsibility to make sure that they're not carrying the coronavirus into settings uh, where they would expose the most vulnerable. And, uh, and lastly, as I prepare to bring Dr. Burks to the podium, I just encourage uh, every American to continue to pray. Pray, pray for our health care workers on the front lines. Um, and just uh, continue to pray that uh, by God's grace, every single day, will each of us do our part to heal our land. With that, uh, I'll introduce the coordinator of the uh, uh, White House effort on the coronavirus, Dr. Deborah Burks. White House effort on the coronavirus, Dr. Deborah Burks. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, thank you for a, that great introduction. Um, just to remind everybody where we have come from in the last four months, we have a great deal of understanding now about the differential disease. Differential infections, no. We believe everybody is susceptible to infection. But we know infection leads to a spectrum of disease, and we have much better details about who is vulnerable and why they are vulnerable. And as the Vice President said, at one time, we were diagnosing people in the ICU after they came into the emergency room. And thanks to the millennials who have been heeding our guidance, they have been coming forward and getting testing. And so whereas before we told them to stay home, now we are telling them to be tested. And this is a great change for us because it allows us now 
to find the asymptomatic and the mild diseases that we couldn't find before. As Dr. Redfield talked about yesterday from the serology test, we have a great understanding of what was happening in March and the number of asymptomatic and mild conditions that led to individuals to have antibody but never come forward with significant disease. We now know who's at risk for significant disease. And we now know it's particularly the elderly, individuals over 80, and individuals with comorbidities. And remember those comorbidities stand the entire age group. We do know that we have people in the younger age groups with significant type 1 diabetes and may also have individuals with significant obesity. We know that those are risk factors, and so risk factors go with your comorbidity, not necessarily with your age. And so as we call on individuals to protect one another, by passing someone on the street, you don't know what comorbidities they have. And this is why we've been focused on trying to protect one another. We also know who is at risk for the highest mortality, and because of that, we've been able to, the clinical care has dramatically improved. And I want to thank NIH, who has been working constantly to update the clinical guidelines. So physicians around the United States and, frankly, around the world who are using those have the most updated information about how to actually improve disease courses of those that are in the hospital. We, of course, have improved treatment in the hospital that we didn't have in, in March and April with improved methods of oxygenation, which is really quite important, improved treatment of acute respiratory distress, that's the, that the individuals on the ventilator, we know now will respond quite well to steroids, and then research that is ongoing on what we call the acute cytokine storm, that is when um, often in that later stage when people are on ventilators, the, the seriously ill may need steroids and other items, and that's being researched. And the work that's being done on clotting research by the NIH. We also have new therapeutics that have been used both as um, compassionate use, like convalescent plasma, and now rendesivir that we just reallocated and ensured it was available to these states that are facing the increased hospitalization, as well as the monthly allocations that we have been sending out. If we can go to the first slide, please, and start where the Vice President left, left off. And really, this disease has tackled community this epidemic and new positives down to the left headline arguing that the law is unconstitutional after Congress ended the tax penalty for not buying. Please. As we discussed, and it's difficult for you to see on this graphic because the top line is New York. And we should remember where we were in that slope, that early slope that you can see in the case of the New York cases, that rapid acceleration. On the same slide, you can see um, California, that is the blue line that is just passing the orange line. And also on the slide is Texas in green, Florida in orange, and Arizona at the bottom. As dramatic as these slopes are, they are not equivalent to the original acceleration that we saw in New York. That doesn't mean that we aren't absolutely focused on working with the governors in those communities to stop the spread of the virus in those four states that we saw in New York. That doesn't mean that we aren't absolutely focused on working with the governors in those communities to stop the spread of the virus in those four states. Next slide, please. This shows you through the entire country that we're tracking state by state. Now, obviously, this axis is vastly different than the one on the prior slide because that slide included all of the cases in New York City. But you can see on this slide that we've been tracking very closely North Carolina. A team's been in with North Carolina working with the state and local public health authorities to really respond to the changes there, as well as um, the, the South Carolina at the bottom. Next slide, I'll just go quickly through these so you can see um, Oklahoma's at the bottom of this slide. And next slide, you can see on this slide um, Idaho and Oregon. Um, those are the ones in the light blue and the dark green where you see an inflection in their slopes. These inflection points and understanding when they occur and why they occur are critical for understanding how to prevent the spread. Next slide. Now what the Vice President talked about is we've created an alert system that brings together what we just talked about, rising cases with an understanding of 
to see those states on that far side that have the highest test positive that you can see at the higher level of the graph. Those are the states that we have concerns about because of the rising number of cases and the rising test positive. This, in, this explains the extent of community spread. In states that have increasing cases but falling test positives, it tells us that they're getting into the communities to find the asymptomatic cases. And so these are the things we put together to understand the full picture. Next slide, please. So this really puts on one slide the states that we have that we've been talking about across the South where we have our greatest concerns. The two top states with the largest increase in test positives are Texas and Arizona, followed by Florida, Mississippi, South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Nevada, and Utah. Those last few states are under still 10%, but we're tracking them closely as we look at that individually. Finally, next slide. You can see on this slide, we are tracking, and this is when you hear about we have a certain 2% or 3% of the counties under specific alerts. So it doesn't matter the size of the county, we're tracking the increase and the rate of increase of new cases at the county level. We currently have about 130 counties out of the 3,100 in the United States in that category. Next slide. At metro level, this shows you the case positivity by the metros um, and the number of tests that have been done. Next slide. And then this shows you specifically the change over time of test positivity in the largest metros where we have concerns. And this is Austin, Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Tampa, Orlando, Miami, Riverside, California, and Atlanta at the bottom. And so this is how we continue to integrate data on cases data on testing and data on hospitalizations so that we can work with the states for a comprehensive integrated response. Next slide. I know many of you would be interested in seeing how high the test positivity rate became in April and May, well March and April. So that top line is New York City Metro and you can see it reached over 50% on a series of days for almost two weeks. 50% of the tests were positive for COVID-19. Underneath that, you see um, New Jersey and Minnesota and a whole series of the governors um, and the local health authorities. So this is Florida. We track testing. It's done the number of test positives that are in the blue line, the total number of cases seen in the black bar, and what we call the syndromic um, presentations of early respiratory diseases and pneumonias. Next slide. This then we look at the county level to look for changes in the slope of the number of new cases. So you can see that top county that has the largest increase in slope in cases is Miami, Miami-Dade, followed by Broward and Palm Beach. All the other counties are much lower in their daily case increases. This allows us to focus resources and testing along with the state into these specific sites. Next slide. That all comes together to, keep the, to create this graphic so that individuals can understand and we can understand precisely what the rate of growth is and where the rate of growth is occurring um, by the shading of the boxes. Now I'm going to quickly take you through Texas because it's the same story. Next slide. So this shows you the exact same graphics now shown for Texas, showing a continued rise in the daily test in the test positivity, the blue line. You can see throughout May, after opening, their test positivity continued to decline as their testing increased. It was in the last two and a half weeks that we saw this inflection of rising test positivity along with rising testing. But it was the increase in test positivity that alerted us, along with the increased cases, that this was becoming an alert. You can see in the red boxes, everything is um, heat mapped. So at a glance, you can tell those two boxes that are in the middle that are red. That's the heat map say, showing that this has rising cases and rising test positivity. Next slide. But even in Texas, next slide please. 
And this gives you a map of Texas that shows where the cases are and where they're rising the most rapidly. And finally, um, I'm just going to go through Arizona very quickly along with California. So next slide. Same situation that we're showing here with Arizona, rising number of tests being performed, but also rising test positivity, rising cases. Next slide. Arizona is unique and they have essentially one county that is primarily represented by the depth of the new cases, and this is in the Phoenix area. Next slide. Then next slide. So this is California. And so you can see California over the last week has had that increase in test positivity. You can see that dramatic increase at the end of that bar in the blue line, along with still increasing test positive, testing that has been done. And we just want to thank all of the governors and all of the work at all the laboratories that has allowed us, along with HHS and Brett Girard, who ensured that the supplies were there to really increase these orange lines. You could see in each of these cases, these orange lines have dramatically gone up over the last four weeks. Next slide. And like New Mexico, the primary infections right now in California at the highest level are in the LA area. But because LA is a large metropolitan area, next slide, you really need this kind of more um, specific and local graphic to really show that it's also increasing in the Central Valley. And this gives us the ability to focus resources among agricultural workers to improve testing and isolation for those who have become positive. So I just wanted to agricultural workers to improve testing and isolation for those who have become positive. So I just wanted to take you through how we've been looking at data, how we consolidate that data, and then Monday report it out to the governors. We hope over the next week to be able to really have this data available in real time on the White House website so that everybody across the country can see where the cases are. Because in the end, we really want to call to the action. When we started talking about what can be done, we said the most important thing that would change the spread, and I'm going to turn that over because I know Tony's going to talk about it, is really individual behavior and our respect for one another through social distancing wearing a mask and ensuring that we're protecting the most vulnerable that may be in multi-generational households. And I just want to end by thanking again the millennials who have come forward. And I know during the protests we asked a lot of them to go forward to get testing and we see those testing rates really improving in the under 40 age group. That is going to be important to continue to accelerate testing among the under 40 age group because that's the age group most likely to have asymptomatic spread and be spreading the virus unbeknownst to them. And I want to really make it clear, no one is intentionally spreading the virus, um, but they don't know that they're positive, they don't have symptoms and need to be tested in order to have that awareness. And so we really want to thank them again for coming forward and really enriching the amount of testing that has been done in the under 40, under 40 year old age group. And to our older population, you know if you have comorbidities, you know if you're over 80. We ask you if in the hot spots in these states that are having expansion in cases to continue to shelter as much as you can and use your grandchildren to go and do your shopping. Thank you very much, Dr. Burks, and, and thank you, Mr. Vice President. So I want to extend just for a couple of minutes some of the comments that were made both by the Vice President and by Dr. Burks, and it has to do with the situation that we're fi we find ourselves facing right now. It's very clear from the maps that you saw that there are certain areas in the country, states, towns, cities, regions, that are doing very well, that have followed the guidelines and are opening up in a prudent way that's been effective. However, as you can see, we are facing a serious problem in certain areas. Now, when you look at the map, it's very interesting because you see some dark parts of the map and some light parts of the map. We have a very heterogeneous country, but heterogeneity does not mean that we are not intimately interconnected with each other. So what goes on in one area of the country ultimately could have an effect on the other areas of the country. So let's take a look at this problem that we're facing now, this resurgence of cases. I don't think there's time enough now all day to try and analyze and figure out the multifaceted elements that went into that. You know, everything from maybe opening a little bit too early on some 
to opening at the right time, but not actually following the steps in an orderly fashion, to actually trying to follow the steps in an orderly fashion, but the citizenry did not feel that they wanted to do that for a number of reasons, likely because everyone feels the common feeling of being pent up for such a long period of time. So we're not going to say blame, we're not going to try and analyze it, but there is something that's very important about it that I'd like to get a message to the country in general. When you have an outbreak of an infectious disease, it's a dynamic process that is global. So remember, what happened in China affected us, what happened in Europe affected us, what's happening here is affecting others. We can't get away from that. It's interconnected. So therefore, if we are an interconnected society, we've got to look at the fact of what our role is in trying to put an end to this. Because everybody wants to end it, everybody wants to get back to normal, and everybody wants the economy to recover. I think we all are pretty common in that. That's a given. So, what can we do? What I think upon talking to a lot of people and reflecting on it, we have such an unusual situation because of all of the decades that I've been involved in chasing infectious diseases. I've never seen anything that is so protean in its ability to make people sick or not. There's no other infectious disease that goes from 40% of the people having no symptoms to some having mild symptoms, to some having severe, some requiring staying at home for weeks, some going to the hospital, some getting intensive care, some getting intubated, some getting ventilated, and some dying. So that depending on where you are in that spectrum, you have a different attitude to this particular thing. But anyone who gets infected or is at risk of getting infected to a greater or lesser degree is part of the dynamic process of the outbreak. And I know because I can understand when I was at a stage in my life when I said, well, I'm invulnerable, so I'm gonna take a risk. I think what we're missing in this is something that we've never faced before, is that a risk for you is not just isolated to you. Because if you get infected, you are part, innocently or inadvertently, of propagating the dynamic process of a pandemic. Because the chances are that if you get infected, that you're going to infect someone else. And although you may feel well, and because we know if you look at the numbers that you're probably here later on, the overwhelming majority now of people getting infected are young people, likely the people that you see in the clips and in the paper who are out in crowds enjoying themselves, understandably, no blame there, understandably. But the thing that you really need to realize that when you do that, you are part of a process. So if you get infected, you will infect someone else who clearly will infect someone else. We know that happens because the reproduction uh, element of the virus is not less than one. So people are infecting other people. And then ultimately you will infect someone who's vulnerable. Now that may be somebody's grandmother, grandfather, uncle, who's on chemotherapy, aunt who's on radiation or chemotherapy, or a child who has leukemia. So there is what I call, and, and again, I just want to bring this out without making it seem that anybody's at fault. You have an individual responsibility to yourself, but you have a societal responsibility because if we want to end this outbreak, really end it, and then hopefully when a vaccine comes and puts the nail in the coffin, we've got to realize that we are part of the process. So when the vice president went back, pulling back a couple of months ago, when we showed about the guidelines to safely reopen the country. We've got to make sure we drop back a few yards and think about that, that this is part of a process that we can be either part of the solution or part of the problem. So I just want to make a plea with people when they understand the stress that they're under as we try to tackle not only those states, but the light colored part of the country, even though they've done well, they may have gotten hit badly like New York and then came down, or they may not have got hit badly at all. They are vulnerable. If we don't extinguish the outbreak, sooner or later, even ones that are doing well are gonna be vulnerable to the spread. 
So we need to take that into account because we are all in it together. And the only way we're going to end it is by ending it together. Thank you. Sure. Users for a week of their... ...around the country working to defeat this virus. All of the health care providers on the front lines, those working to reopen our economy safely, the American people who have sacrificed so much in this fight, and the incredible members of our HHS team who've been working tirelessly to protect the health and well-being of all Americans. Before covering today's topic, I want to mention a major milestone for global health yesterday. The end of the second largest Ebola outbreak in history in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. We congratulate the Congolese government and all of the healthcare workers and community members involved, some of whom I had the chance to meet and thank in the DRC last fall. Under President Trump, the United States was proud to play a bigger role in this major public health victory than any other single nation. And now, thanks to the President and the Vice President's leadership and the hard work of our team, America has never been readier to combat COVID-19. We build up our readiness under the strategy we developed to address surges, save lives, and in time defeat the virus. We're in a much stronger position to support states, hospitals, and individuals as they fight back. There are six parts to the strategy. Surveillance, testing, containment, healthcare capacity, therapeutics, and vaccines. First, we've been strengthening surveillance so that we can be aware of and respond to surges. That means, for instance, being able to track more cases among younger Americans that we never would have caught earlier in the pandemic. Second, we have the world's greatest testing capabilities, enabling us to confirm the presence of the virus when it crops up, and we're confident that capacity will continue to rise in the coming months. Third, states are building the capacity to track and contain outbreaks of the virus. With federal help, many states have substantially expanded their own capabilities and we're deploying knowledgeable, experienced CDC and HHS public health teams to the areas now seeing increases with a focus on community testing and community-based interventions. Fourth, we're helping healthcare systems secure sufficient capacity and supplies. We've dramatic ex dramatically expanded community testing and community-based interventions. Fourth, we're helping healthcare systems secure sufficient capacity and supplies. We've dramatic ex dramatically expanded American manufacturing of PPE, and the FDA has authorized new technologies to sterilize equipment for reuse. We've spoken with hospitals and states that are building up their own PPE reserves, many of them getting up to 60 or 90 days of supplies. Through the strategic national stockpile, we have far more visibility into the supply needs across the country, including centralized coordination capabilities that we lacked just a few short months ago. Visiting healthcare providers around the country, I've seen how they're adapting. America's hospitals are ready to get back to business while maintaining their readiness for COVID-19. The fifth and sixth elements of this strategy are thanks to the president's Operation Warp Speed. We now have promising therapeutics that are benefiting tens of thousands of American patients and in all likelihood have already saved thousands of lives. We've identified two very promising pharmaceutical treatments, remdesivir and dexamethasone. As of today, we've allocated more than 120,000 courses of remdesivir to all of the 50 states. We've added dexamethasone, a very low-cost steroid, to our treatment guidelines, and we believe it's reasonable to assume that other corticosteroids, which may be more readily accessible in some places, would have similar immunological effects. Another promising therapeutic, convalescent plasma, has been used to treat more than 25,000 Americans in nearly 3,000 sites across the country. There are no certainties in science, but with more than 140 clinical trials underway in the U.S., it's a pretty safe bet that more good news on therapeutics is on the way and on the way soon. Finally, we've announced large investments to support three different vaccine candidates all the way through to manufacturing. These candidates are now in human clinical trials, expanding manufacturing capacity and already making the vials, needles, and syringes that we may need. Our capabilities have grown exponentially in the time allowed by the patriotic sacrifices of the American people. We have a much better grasp of the virus, as Dr. Burke said, and much more data with which to model it. With that data, as you've heard today, we can focus on local trends. We have some very concerning hotspots, and we can track when other hotspots emerge, as we expect they may. 
We're focused on the states and the counties within those states, just 3% of counties that represent hotspots. It's important for the American people to be aware of this variability and variation across the country. Americans need to understand their local trends because we want to help people make the right decisions for themselves. Making decisions for yourself has to be based on three axes of risk as our Surgeon General taught us in March. You want to assess where you are, who you are and whom you live with, and what activity you're thinking about doing. Risk within each of these axes. Going to an outdoor restaurant in Montana is a great deal different from a crowded indoor bar in Houston. When you interact with fewer people in an activity, when you interact with them for a shorter period of time, your risk is reduced. And individuals can balance these kinds of factors. What I've laid out today is remarkable progress by the President's administration and a particular credit to the team here at HHS. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, but Americans can be confident that we have a rock-solid foundation to help us get safely back to work, back to school, back to worship, and back to healthy health while we tackle surges of the virus where they occur. Thanks to President Trump's leadership, we've got the capabilities, the knowledge, and the strategy to protect Americans' lives and their livelihoods at the same time. And every American should feel proud of that. Thank you. To protect Americans' lives and their livelihoods at the same time. And every American should feel proud of that. Thank you. I wanted to add some comments. Uh, once again, I want to stress and thank all Americans uh, to embrace the importance of social distancing recommendations to slow the spread of COVID. As I've said before, we're not defenseless. Uh, these are, in fact, very powerful weapons, and it's our collective responsibility to recommit ourselves to put them into routine practice. Again, to stay six feet apart from each other as much as possible, to wear face coverings when we're in public, and to practice vigorous hand hygiene. And to commit to do so, as we've heard today, to do our part to protect the vulnerable. I also want to appeal to the millennials and those that are under 40. It's really important that this group really commit themselves uh, to these practices to protect those at risk. And it's not just the elderly that are at risk. Many of us may have friends and colleagues that are younger that may not uh, advertise their underlying comorbidities, uh, as the case would be with, say, type 1 diabetes or an underlying immune deficiency. So, again, asking this team, uh, millennials and youngers, people in this country to come and commit themselves. I agree with uh, Ambassador Burks. Uh, we're very thankful that the group is now coming forward uh, to get tested, but I also want this group to put into vigilant practice uh, the importance of our social distancing. It was now coming forward uh, to get tested, but I also want this group to put into vigilant practice uh, the importance of our social distancing. The one thing that I wanted to stress, though, is that there are differences in what we're experiencing today than what we all experienced in March and April and May. And one of the things I want us to focus on is not the cases, per se, but the consequences, the impact of those cases. It wasn't long ago, probably within two months ago, it's hard to believe, I don't think many people realize, that 27% of all deaths that occurred in the United States actually died of a pneumonia. That was a pneumonia, could have been influenza, could have been COVID. 27%, one in four of all the deaths in the United States just two months ago was caused by pneumonia. I'm happy to say today the deaths to pneumonia in this nation is back to baseline. It's about 7%. It's a big difference. A lot of those pneumonias that were dying were actually COVID-infected individuals that were uh, the elderly, nursing homes, and individuals with comorbidities. We are seeing, despite these increased cases, we have seen a progressive decline in deaths. Uh, the last, say, two-week average 
deaths in the United States now is around six, 650. And as you heard the Vice President, it wasn't long ago that sadly we were losing 25,000 individuals a day. So I think it's critical that we continue to focus on, on, on that, the consequences. And it's part of that why it's important that we continue also to look forward to how we deal with and contain and control the COVID infection, but as we also change the consequences of the impact it's had on education in this country or as an economy and business. So again, as I close, I want to just re-emphasize re, re, re how important um, for now, for individuals to really think seriously, as Tony said, about the responsibility to others that we have, because this infection pathogen really does have the capacity to cause quite serious illness in individuals at high risk and embrace our nation's uh, recommendations that the Vice President uh, put up again that we have for all phases of reopening America. Tested. Clearly what we're seeing now is this age group is much more likely to be asymptomatic and, and again to make that commitment to do their part to protect those of us that whether we're young or old have a comorbidity and would be more vulnerable to serious illness from this virus. Thank you very much. Are stressing the importance of social distancing um, and also the threat of crowds. Yet your campaign has no two massive rallies, no social distancing, no masks. Can you tell me, even Dr. Fauci has talked about not gathering in, in large crowds. Um, can you tell me how why you continue to do this? Why the campaign continues to hold these rallies? Well, the the freedom of speech, the right to peaceably assemble is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and uh, we have an election coming up this fall. And uh, President Trump and I believe uh, that uh, taking proper steps as we created screening at recent events and, um, and uh, giving people the very best counsel that we have, we still want to give people the freedom to participate in the political process. and. Uh, uh, we respect that. Uh, I was uh, I was pleased to see that now uh, uh, the better part of a week uh, since we were in Oklahoma, I think their positivity rate uh, is actually declined as of today, and uh, uh, that's a great testament to the fact that uh, uh, people are using common sense. They're being responsible. Uh, they know and understand what's happening in the community in which they live, and our emphasis today is really to say that. Um, we think it's it's most helpful if if the American people understand that what we're seeing across the South today is really uh, outbreaks. And they're outbreaks that are in specific counties. In some cases, they're outbreaks uh, that are in specific communities. Uh, and uh, we've surged CDC personnel, HHS personnel. I, I didn't mention before, but uh, three weeks ago when we were seeing similar activity. In, North Carolina and, and uh, Alabama, we sent personnel uh, into those states and uh, we've actually seen declining numbers beginning in both of those states. So um, the important thing is that not, not one size fits all. Uh, the overall guidance to every American to practice good hygiene, to practice uh, the measures that we recommended at home and at work um, stand. But, um, but uh, our focus today is to make sure that in those areas of the country where we're seeing a significant, not only increase in cases, but an increase in positivity level that the American people know just how important it is to listen to what their state and local health officials uh, are directing them to do. Please. I was curious, it seems like the wearing of masks has kind of become a political statement, or I guess the decision not to wear a mask. Are you concerned about that? Um, and is there a message that you would like to send to people about the importance of wearing masks? Well, we, we think that where, uh, the first principle is that people ought to listen to their state and local authorities. I mean, I, I have to tell you, President Trump and I couldn't be more grateful for the partnership we forged with governors around the country. Um, uh, I spoke to uh, uh, the governor of Florida, of Arizona, of Texas, uh, I spoke to uh, uh, the governor of Florida, of Arizona, of Texas, just within the last 12 hours. And I told them that from this podium today, we would remind their citizens to 
to heed uh, the guidance and the direction of state and local officials. In some cases, there's uh, statewide guidance with regard to facial coverings and with regard uh, to um, uh, events and gatherings. In other cases, there are specific uh, countywide or citywide uh, directives. Uh, and we just believe that what's most important here is that people listen to uh, the leadership in their state, the leadership in their local community, and adhere to that guidance, whether that have to do with facial coverings, whether it have to do with the size of gatherings. And uh, we'll continue to reinforce that message. Please. Please. I have two questions, actually. You just mentioned the importance of listening to state and local authorities. What is the correlation between the spike in cases that we're seeing in states like Texas and Florida and the way those states handled re their reopening? Was it too much too soon? And secondly, I wanted to ask Dr. Fauci, you said in an interview that, um, quote, something is not working. What isn't working? And did you all in your meeting today come up with a plan to fix whatever isn't working? Well, let me respond first, and then I'll let Dr. Uh, uh, Fauci address it as well, and Dr. Uh, Burks may as well. Um, I, I think there will be a temptation for people to look at uh, these Sun Belt states uh, that have been reopening and putting people back to work the last week or so. But uh, frankly, in the case of each of these states, they reopened, in some cases, almost two months ago. And, and their tests cases, uh, their new cases that from testing was low and steady, their positivity rate uh, was low. Um, what, what we're observing uh, today, and I've heard this from Florida, I've heard this from Texas, and some other states uh, along the Sun Belt, is that uh, we're seeing more and more young people uh, under the age uh, of 35 who are testing positive. In many cases, they have no symptoms. Um, but they're coming forward uh, uh, and confirming that they that they have contracted uh, the coronavirus in positive. In many cases, they have no symptoms, um, but they're coming forward uh, uh, and confirming that they that they have contracted uh, the coronavirus. Uh, we're working with the states. And you speak about our plan. We've got we've got CDC personnel embedded in every state in the union. We're surging more CDC personnel. Uh, as requested to each of these states to help them unpack what the data is suggesting. I know the governor of uh, Texas announced uh, some new measures this morning, which we fully uh, support. Uh, but what we're going to continue to do is give, give our state leadership the very best information, the very best counsel uh, that we have. And, and, and if there's one message that uh, comes through today, I hope it is, it is saying to younger Americans in these states and in these counties in particular that um, they are, are uh, a big part uh, of the numbers that we are seeing in new cases. And while there may not be a significant threat of a serious health outcome to them, uh, I, I know of no young person, and I got, I got three 20-somethings in my immediate family, uh, no young person would ever want to inadvertently expose uh, a mom, a dad, a grandmother, a grandfather, or someone who's vulnerable uh, to a serious result. And so alerting them that there's been spread among that age group, urging them to take countermeasures and heed what their governors and, and local officials are directing will be our, our continued strategy. So what I meant by what is not working and this is not anybody's fault or any institution's fault, is that what we're dealing with right now is community spread in the context of, of a substantial proportion of the people who are getting infected do not know they're infected, they're not symptomatic, they're asymptomatic individuals. The classic paradigm of identification, isolation, and contact tracing to actually contain that is very difficult to make that work under those circumstances. You superimpose upon that the fact that even with identification, isolation, and contact tracing, often the dots are not connected. If you get on the phone and talk to people who are in some of these communities, you find that a lot of it is done by phone. And when it's done by phone, maybe half of the people don't even want to talk to one who they think is a government representative. If you live in a community that is mostly brown or black, you're in a different situation that maybe 70% of them don't really want to talk to you. You can identify a contact 
but you don't isolate them because you don't have the facility to isolate them. That is what's not working. So what we're going to do, and we are doing, and you're going to be hearing about this, you know, flooding the, flooding the area of a community to get a feel for what's out there, particularly among the asymptomatics. So in other words, it's a paradigm shift because we're dealing with young people, people who are going to be asymptomatic, and people who are getting infected in a community setting, not an outbreak setting where you know who to identify, isolate, and contact trace. Right. That's what I meant. So, Dr. Fauci, yeah, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci, do you, oh, sorry, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks, can I just, I just want to finish it, expand his thought for just a second. Um, about three months ago, we talked about how important it was to have community at the center. And I think when you talk about what's going to be different, um, and part of the reason why the president and vice president have asked me to go out to Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, is to not only meet with the state and local health officials, but to meet with the community groups, so that the community groups can help us support community-specific messaging. Public health messaging, when you just keep saying the same thing over and over again, and the people get tone deaf to it, it's because it's not tailored to their specific circumstances and they don't see that message resonating in their lives. We've had to do this across the world. Um, I've done this over and over again for HIV, TB, and malaria. At the center of this has to be the community, and the community will help us identify who needs to be tested. They'll help us identify which households have the most vulnerability in them, and how we can really go into those communities and support that response at a very local and ground level. When we started this, we were very much facility-based, and we know facilities carry us a long way. But if we want to change the transmission rates in these metros, in specific communities and in specific parts of those metros, we've got to walk, walk side by side with our community leaders and our community groups that know how to translate our scientific dogma and information down to a level, level where people will understand it, hear it, and act on it. I know when they hear it and understand it, they will act on it. And so that's how, when you ask what's going to be different, that has already started and it's already going to be different. Dr. Burke, you know, question. That's very important to underscore what Dr. Burke said, and that's exactly what's being planned to do, to get people who know the community, who live in the community, who the community trusts. Right. Dr. Right, let's go. How about right here? Do you expect the death rate to go up in the next three or four weeks, just like we're seeing the rate of infection go up now? Well, our, our hope and our prayers is not the case. Um, we've seen, as you, as you noted, we've seen a precipitous decline in fatalities. And again, I, I, one is too many. Um, we grieve the loss of every American life. But the fact that two months ago we had lost 2,500 Americans in a single day, and two days this week we lost less than 300 Americans it is a testament uh, to our healthcare workers, to all of the medicines that Secretary Azar just described being, being available in all 50 states. It's a testament um, to the efforts uh, of the American people, and we hope as we continue to engage that we'll continue to see those. Uh, numbers decline. The other reason we're encouraged is because um, at this point, when we look at our losses, um, roughly 2.5% uh, of all of our losses uh, took place in people under the age of 25. I mean, younger Americans, and in each case, uh, or at least 90% of the cases, they were people with, with pre-existing conditions, underlying conditions that contributed uh, to the sad outcome. Uh, so it, as we see that in Florida and in Texas, they've reported to us that half or even more than half of the new cases that are showing up uh, every day uh, are people under the age of 35 or younger Americans, in most cases asymptomatic. Uh, our, our hope is, is that, that those younger, healthy Americans, like most have already, will continue um, to uh, go through the coronavirus, uh, will recover. But our message today, as we've spent so much energy in the last four months protecting the most vulnerable, I mean, we've deployed testing resources, we've supported states' efforts, 
Uh, states across the country in the last month have answered our call to test all the residents of their nursing homes to set up a plan to test uh, all of the staff uh, on a regular basis. Um, we, we need to protect the most vulnerable and we want a message going out to younger Americans, particularly those along the Sun Belt, uh, in these counties where we see new cases on the rise, positivity on the rise, to know that we, we need them uh, to do their part uh, to make sure and protect uh, the most vulnerable so that we can, so that we don't see those losses rise. But it's, it's in the hands of the American people, in particular this country. All right, guys, last question. Right there. Sure. Though, like you're saying, do as we say, not as we do. You're telling people to listen to local officials, but in Tulsa, you defy local health officials to have an event that, even though you say it didn't result in a spike, dozens of Secret Service agents, dozens of campaign staffers are now quarantined after positive tests. And then in Arizona, one of the hardest hit states, you packed a church with young people who weren't wearing masks. So, how can you say that the campaign is not part of the problem that Dr. Fauci laid out? Well, I, I want to remind you again that the freedom of speech and the right to peaceably assemble is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and even in a health crisis, the American people don't forfeit our constitutional rights. And working with state officials, um, uh, as we did in Oklahoma and as, uh, uh, as we did uh, in Arizona, uh, we're creating settings where people can choose to participate uh, in the political process. And, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, it, it, I, think it's, I think it's really important uh, that we recognize how important, uh, how important freedom and personal responsibility are to this entire equation. And, but allowing, allowing, younger Americans, allowing Amer younger Americans to understand, particularly in the counties that are most impacted, uh, uh, the unique challenges uh, that uh, we're facing uh, in their age group, we think, uh, is important. But look, it's 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 so important that we recognize that, that as we issued guidance to reopen America now two months ago, and now as all 50 states are opening up our country again, people are going back to work. Months ago. And now as all 50 states are opening up our country again, people are going back to work. American everyday life is being restored kind of one step, one day at a time. I, I think it's important that we remind ourselves this is not a choice between the health of the American people and a strong economy. There are profound health implications uh, to the lockdowns through which we just passed. I heard, a, I heard a statistic not long ago at a, at, a, at a task force briefing that in one jurisdiction there had been a 50% increase in the number of people presenting at emergency rooms having attempted suicide. I mean, there are profound mental health issues. There are profound economic issues, people needing to be back to work. And, um, and so we're, we're, uh, our objective here today is just to make sure the American people know in 34 states, the cases are largely stable and there's no combination of rising cases and rising positivity rates. That's a tribute to the American people. And in the, in the 16 states we're focused on uh, today, um, uh, we simply want to, we want to equip particularly young people with the knowledge of the part that they can play in, in stemming uh, the rising tide of new cases. Not because the coronavirus represents a significant threat to them, in most cases, it doesn't if you're a younger American. But because we don't, no younger American would ever want to spread the coronavirus to someone who would have a serious outcome. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the time today. Uh, we hope this has been helpful. Uh, and uh, we'll be back with more information as time goes on. Thank you. Well, good morning out west, good afternoon in the east. I am Chuck Todd, and you've been just the Coronavirus Task Force, members of the task force, just wrapped up their first briefing in nearly two months, took a handful of questions, clearly not satisfying that press corps that was in there. 
uh, a lot more uh, arms and hands and uh, shouts went up there. They did only take a, a, a few questions. Vice President Pence, who led the briefing, attempted to downplay the news surge multiple times, and he dodged a question about whether people should wear masks. I spoke to uh, uh, the governor of Florida, of Arizona, of Texas, just within the last 12 hours. And I told them that from this podium today, we would remind their citizens to, to heed uh, the guidance and the direction of state and local officials. We just believe that what's... Well, the, the biggest takeaway is that uh, they, the, 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 the CDC has to do a better job in, in, in targeting those communities, um, especially in, in Florida and Arizona, and and work with lo the local leaders. You know, to leave it up to the you know to the governors in a big picture is really the message is not getting there. Uh, you know, I I, I I talk to a lot of Latino uh, communities, uh, and it, it's it's you know they're they're not getting the message clearly, and therefore, if you look at the numbers of people that are asymptomatic, which is really the here. The story here is that we're seeing more and more asymptomatic patients, and asymptomatic patients feel completely normal. They don't have a cold, they don't have any fever, but they're spreading the virus. So when that happens, the you know communities, especially the underserved communities, are getting more and more reinfections, and that is showing in the numbers. Now the good news is that those people, the younger the younger people, are not really having major symptoms. They're not ending up in the emergency room. They're not going to the sick you, they're not being ventilated. So you see those numbers, four to five percent admission rates continue to be the norm. But uh, again, that that whole thing can spread out and explode again. I mean, we've been preparing for a second wave in the f late fall or, or, or in the winter here in the Northeast because we're not sure what's going to happen. So I'm glad that they're leaving Washington and going down to those communities and working with local leaders in order, in order to get the word out. city by city, for some of you, it might be neighborhood by neighborhood. And we know that you're taking a priority in the steps to do things in the manner that's best. You will never have to question my devotion to you or our marriage. Even though, of course, everyone's been cooped up for so long, they can't go out and just behave like everything is back to normal. We heard that from Dr. Fauci. We heard the vice president stress that as well. We heard Dr. Burke say they need to get tested now because a lot of them could be asymptomatic. My question there is, of course, I think anecdotally we all see that going on, but there's also this issue of the politicization of masks. You have a lot of people who are not young who will not be wearing masks, and yet it seems certainly coming from the vice president that was ignored. So. Talk to us about kind of the population that it was really stressed upon kind of needs to get it together. And then talk to us about actually the reality of the populations who need to maybe be doing more, Sanjay. Yeah, you know, it, it was interesting to me because there were some very specific questions uh, that were uh, expected about these rallies and, and what were the, the, the recommendations or the guidance for these rallies. How can you say one thing at the podium from the Department of Health and Human Services and then have these rallies where people are not wearing masks? And, you know, the vice president sort of cloaked it in First Amendment. You know, these are, these are, this is a freedom of expression, freedom of speech, despite the fact that the ordinances in those communities said people should be wearing masks and should be doing all they can to mitigate the spread. With regard to young people specifically, uh, there's, there's no question, and we've known this for some time, this is not new science to say that people can spread this virus even if they're not showing symptoms. So therein lies the, the, the issue. Young people are far less likely to develop symptoms, that's a good thing, we know that, but they can still spread this virus and we're clearly seeing that now. I mean, they, they, they can spread it. I think one of the points that Dr. Burks made, maybe inadvertently or intentionally, I'm not sure, but who is at risk, really, right? We know older people are at risk, but also people with comorbidities. Uh, what are some of the comorbidities? Obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Brianna, when you start to look at those comorbidities and, and apply it to the population of the United States, despite your age, you're starting to look at a large segment of the country that would now be considered vulnerable in some way. So, you know, I, I think Dr. Fauci um, struck a different tone with regard to this issue than others, basically saying, look, 
I don't care if your, your state is, is beige or it's green or it looks stable or improving, everyone is still vulnerable at this point. We really got to all behave like we have the virus and implement these basic public health measures. Yeah, pregnant women are more vulnerable, right? We're seeing in, in the data about hospitalizations, they're much more likely to be hospitalized than women their age who are not pregnant. So that's also uh, an issue that's there. Right. Um, I wonder, Dr. Hotez, if I can bring you into this, stressing the vice president that reopening has not caused the uptick in cases. He said in some cases, you look at these states down south and they reopened two months ago. Of course, we know that there's been a phased reopening. If you look at the exact date of when this started in, uh, say, Texas or Florida, yes, maybe it was almost two months ago, but these are phased reopenings. And as we see people kind of lag behind what is reopening and then getting more comfortable with the idea of perhaps participating in that reopening, you have, I wonder what you think about it, because I, I see young people who maybe are more likely to go to bars and restaurants, which are uh, an issue when it comes to the spread. And yet he seems to be saying like young people are to blame, but the reopening of bars and restaurants are not. What did you make of that? Well, there's a, a lot to unpack here. Um, first of all, I would say I re this helped remind me why I stopped watching the White House Coronavirus Task Force briefings. They're disorganized and uninformative, and, and you really learn nothing. Uh, what we know is we're seeing a massive resurgence in our metropolitan areas across the southwestern part of the United States, uh, here in Houston, in Dallas, in Phoenix, uh, and into Los Angeles. Uh, the vice president said uh, the good news is there's no increase in positivity rate. That's absolutely false. We're seeing a steep increase uh, in positivity rate and uh, the num and we will soon see an increase in deaths as well, and that was also obscured. We know the death rates will the deaths will follow the big resurgence in in the number of cases. Um, they still clung to this discredited idea that uh, a lot of the increase is due to uh, increase in testing. I'm looking at some of my notes here. Uh, there was no predictive models. There was no coherent overview um, on what the nature of this crisis is and what the basis of it is beyond beyond the reopening. And the terrible part for me was there were no ideas presented. They have no idea what to do. There is no concrete federal plan for helping the metro areas. Uh, there was not a single suggestion made on what they do. They said they're now sending some officers from the CDC to analyze the data. Really? I mean, we've had this resurgence now for two weeks, and now they're sending in CDC officers uh, to look at the data. Um, this is this is a tragedy. And, and what's more, it's not presented as a tragedy. It's presented as we're doing a pretty good job, and now there are a couple of hot spots. These are not hot spots. These are the largest metropolitan areas in the United States. We're talking Houston, Phoenix. Uh, Los Angeles. This is uh, the uh, th this is a huge uh, increase in acceleration in the epidemic, and it's clear that this next part uh, is headed to be far worse in terms of number of cases, in terms of uh, number of hospitalizations, and likely number of deaths than the first wave was uh, in New York City. So uh, I'm trying not to sound apoplectic here, but uh, this is. This is really unfortunate. We, we need, not now more than ever, good federal leadership. We need guidance. We need a roadmap. We need a plan. We didn't do any of that. And uh, you know, so I completely uh, agree with uh, what Sanjay said, and I would just pile on a bit more to say that um, there, is no, uh, there is no plan for how we're going to move forward uh, going down the line. Uh, they say the reopening is going well. The reopening has been uh, an unmitigated disaster. Yeah, and, and the difference... The, the large part is because more people are getting sick. More people are getting symptoms, and they go in and get the test. Uh, the intensity and, the, and the, uh, the positivity rate has been very, very high in many, many places, including in two or three counties in my state, and we've been one of the more successful states in bending the curve down. 
So when you feel that you you have some sort of right to lie to the American people, that's what happens. And I'll tell you, it, it, it's costing lives right now. This is infuriating. Look, we're fighting. We're fighting every day to try to save lives in my state and have the President of the United States effectively tell people in my state that effectively they shouldn't wear masks, that these don't work. Uh, this is infuriating. These are life and death decisions you and your fellow governors have to make right now. Wearing a mask is a, is, is a really simple thing to do. You would think the president and the vice president would be promoting that, but clearly they are not. But before I let you go, Governor, I want to get your, a quick reaction during this coronavirus crisis. You have another pressing uh, issue in your state. The mayor of Seattle is working to try to reclaim what's called this police-free autonomous zone six block area that was overtaken by demonstrators. What's your message to those who are occupying that neighborhood right now? Well, look, we are committed to uh, ending police brutality. I've started my task force. We're, I, I believe we will be successful in taking major steps in police accountability measures. And that's not all because we know we have racial injustice throughout our society. And these folks have had an impact. Look, they've raised the consciousness we had 60,000 people uh, uh, demonstrating peaceably. The vast majority of people who are raising our consciousness have acted peacefully. Those folks that are now, I know there's other ways to protest. Uh, the, the Black Lives Movement are talking about how to have another place. And uh, I think we are going to succeed having a peaceful transition. So we can get police, uh, police services into this neighborhood. We do need that. Everybody knows we need that. And I think we're going to make progress on both fronts fairly quickly. Well, good luck, uh, Governor Lee. Uh, we appreciate the Thank time you. uh, you're spending with us. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Wash your hands. Mask up. And, and social distancing is very, very critical. These are not <laughs> tough things to do, but they're critically important. It's free. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, good advice. Uh, just ahead, uh, we have our medical experts who are standing by to break down the danger points uh, that are... ...commit to using an... London accent. Hot tubs all on sale. Umbrellas 50% off. Five piece patio sets starting. You sure you want to do this? Frank, whom I served with in Congress, has been and continues to be a part of this resolution. Each resolution that I have sponsored has times and as courthouses start to reopen. Um, this would help prevent together in hospital, together at home. What? Uh, a third of all African Americans know someone who has died of COVID. We know that there are 40 million Americans who have applied for unemployment, not even considering the number of Americans who don't even, uh, are, aren't even in occupations who are eligible to receive unemployment. This country is really hurting. And we, you know, we always ask ourselves, all right, we've talked about this for years. When you go to the polls, can you ask yourself, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And there are gonna be a lot of independents and quite a few Republicans who are gonna to have to ask themselves the hard questions and possibly say no. Uh, and, and we're leaving aside the Republicans who don't like the racial animus or what I would call racism and anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. xenophobia that also comes along with the incompetence and the experience as a word. Well, uh, Steve, Christina, as she so often does on this program and elsewhere, uh, you know, lays it out, makes the strong points. And I think that goes to the connection between what we've been covering throughout the week, which is bright red MAGA governors, like in Texas and Florida, going, we tried, we did what we did. Uncle, buckle, can't go on, can't reopen. That tells you something that is always first a health care and public wellness issue, and we've covered it as such, but on the politics team, you can see this. Uh, Trump's sagging popularity, dragging down uh, candidates in the state level, governors and senates running statewide. Down ballot Republicans will have to decide if they will ride the Trump train to its final destination, the New York Times notes, or if they need to establish some independence. That's from a Republican uh, quoted there in the, in the story. Steve. I think part of the problem is, even if they were to try to distance themselves from Trump, we, we, they have no real record to run on. They have no real agenda to run on. You can't look to Republicans at any level of government right now and say, well, with all the major challenges facing the country, here's a group of people with a platform. Here's a group of people with a vision. Here's an agenda that they can present to the public. There's nothing there. They literally don't even have a platform. They're recycling no. the 2016 platform. 
And so what is it that they can propose in terms of solutions to the problems that people are, are dealing with in their daily lives? Right. I think I think it's a blank slate. Well, and Steve, that really comes back to the, the, the work you've been doing, and you write about it for MSNBC.com and in the book, that what you call post policy. And we didn't know when we planned to have you on that Donald Trump would be on TV last night sounding like he literally couldn't come up with 15 seconds of policy for re-election. Uh, the question still remains, Steve, um, what do you prefer, post-policy or post-Malone? <laughs> well, I'm going to go with the latter because the post-policy is clearly failing the United States in every meaningful way. So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote with the latter. <laughs> um, and, Christina, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, Ari, I, I appreciate you. I mean, but the thing is, it, it's like how we can have levity in these moments. But it's because we are in such a crisis because there is absolutely no leadership at the executive level and within the Republican Party. So we're, we're driving on, on sort of two out of four wheels here. Well, uh, yep, and that's why sometimes we need dad jokes more than ever. Um, Professor Greer knows how to hang. Steve has been uh, very gracious. I will tell everyone, in all seriousness, the book is Imposters, How Republicans Quit Governing. Justice is essential, but violence and destruction of property is not the way to ensure it. Agents in this room are also watching social... The first alert weather... See updated ag markets every evening on... Oh, all in all, not too bad a weekend ago. All right, thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Tonight, the warning of a catastrophic and unsustainable situation with COVID-19. The U.S. hits nearly 45,000 new coronavirus cases in a single day, the largest ever. Tonight, as hospitals struggle to find beds, the Houston area declares a code red. The governors of Texas and Florida shutting down bars again. Plus, the warning to young people from the nation's top infectious disease doctor. Mixed messages after nearly two months of silence, the president's task force speaks out. Uh, we have uh, made uh, truly remarkable progress. But are they on the same page? We are facing a serious problem in certain areas. Plus, the vice president defends those large rallies, no masks required. Like you're saying, do as we say, not as we do. Deadly workplace shooting. A gunman opens fire at an Illinois factory, setting off a manhunt. Multiple people dead. We have the latest. Million per day. Lines so long, some people waiting up to 13 hours. And even as cases soar, at least two major airlines say they will begin booking flights at full capacity beginning next week, including using those middle seats, how they plan to keep passengers safe. Also making headlines tonight, a suspected hate crime under investigation. An 18-year-old biracial woman claiming four white men set her on fire while she was driving. The FBI now on the case. Her message for the alleged attackers. And the massive Godzilla dust cloud moving over the U.S. this weekend, stretching from Texas to Virginia, what it could mean for the air you breathe. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us on a busy Friday night. I'm Cecilia Vega, in for David, and we do begin with that breaking news. New numbers just in. 44,000 new coronavirus cases in the U.S. today alone, a third straight day of record highs. Those cases now rising in 29 states. Texas and Florida hit especially hard, and tonight they are both imposing new restrictions to slow the spread. 5,700 new cases in Texas. The governor there closing bars a day after pausing further reopenings and suspending elective surgeries in the biggest metro areas to free up hospital beds for the expected surge of new patients. A record nearly 9,000 cases reported in Florida. Bars there now closed too. Hospitals in Arizona activating surge plans to handle COVID cases. And today the White House task force holding its first public briefing for the first time in two months. ABC's Marcus Moore leads us off from Dallas. Tonight, Florida and Texas with a stunning reversal. Now shutting down bars, racing to contain new outbreaks. The governor of Texas ordering all bars and outdoor tubing businesses to close immediately and limiting...
traveling to EU countries because of the dramatic increase in coronavirus, coronavirus cases right here in the U.S. Well, Wall Street had a sharp reaction to all of that today. The Dow dropped more than 700 points, almost 3%. There's a lot of news to get to on this Friday, and our team of correspondents is standing by to cover it all. CBS's Manuel Bohorkas is going to lead off our coverage tonight from Miami. Good evening, Manny. Good evening, Nora. For perspective, the previous one-day record for new cases in Florida was 5,500. The state has shattered that at nearly 9,000. And even though testing did hit a record high, the average percentage of tests that come back positive, well, that's five times higher now than it was at the beginning of the month. There was another rush to get tested in Florida today. We found Olivia Pelias and her father Jose at the line in Miami Beach. Well, he found out yesterday that his boss is infected, so he had to come today to get tested. This afternoon, Governor Ron DeSantis tried to calm fears. Really nothing has changed in the past week in terms of we had a big test dump. We've been testing 10 to 15 percent have been tested positive for really the last week. But even he had to reverse course on reopenings. The state effectively ordered bars to shut down. Younger people are driving the surge of new cases. They have better survival rates, but can infect groups that don't, said Dr. Anthony Fauci at the first White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing in nearly two months. Now that may be somebody's grandmother, grandfather, uncle who's on chemotherapy. 31 states have reported a jump in cases compared to two weeks ago. Delaware, Maine, and New Mexico are among the latest to scale back reopenings. Former CDC director Dr. Tom Frieden believes some states reopened too soon. And these are places that opened while they were still increasing. To open while you're increasing is kind of like leaning into a left hook. Uh, you're going to get hit. Do you unfortunately expect to see the death rate tick back up? Well, uh, there is a lag. So we're definitely going in the wrong direction nationally in terms of deaths. In Arizona, ICU beds are nearly 90 percent full. And while some treatments have improved, Phoenix doctor Mutazar Akhtar still worries. The real concern is the sickest people won't show up until a couple of weeks from now. And I'm really concerned about that. No county has more COVID-19 cases now than Los Angeles. Rick Garay says 30 members of his extended family caught the virus. His father died from it. You know, our parents should die of old age. They shouldn't have to succumb to coronavirus because somebody doesn't want to wear a mask or because somebody doesn't want to follow protocol during a crisis. At today's coronavirus task force briefing, Dr. Fauci urged what he called societal responsibility, saying that what is happening in hotspots now can affect other parts of the country, including states that brought their numbers down. Nora. All right, Manny Bohorquez, thank you. We're going to turn now to the other hotspot of Houston, where hospitals are running out of space. The city is considering using a stadium complex as overflow. But there is positive news out of that city. One ICU chief says lessons from early on in the pandemic have helped them learn how to treat these patients. Janet Shamlan is outside a busy hospital in Houston. Good evening, Janet. From local health officials, while at the same time, defending those campaign rallies that took place in defiance of local warnings. He said those rallies are all about freedom of speech. Here's ABC's Mary Bruce from the White House. President Trump at the White House today meeting with his daughter's workforce advisory board and barely acknowledging the growing coronavirus crisis. But we have a little work to do and we'll get it done. He left it to his vice president to put a positive spin on the administration's response, even as cases surge. We flattened the curve. We saved lives. But the health experts painted a darker picture, pleading with Americans to socially distance and avoid large crowds for the sake of the greater good. I want to just re, 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 re-emphasize how important for individuals to really think seriously, as Tony said, about the responsibility to others that we have. Our Kira Phillips asking Pence, why then is the Trump campaign holding large rallies? Can you tell me why you continue to do this? Why the campaign continues to hold these rallies? Well, the, the freedom of speech, the right to peaceably assemble is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and uh, we have an election coming up this fall. Reporters kept pressing. In Tulsa, you defied local health officials to have an event that even though you say it didn't result in a spike, dozens of Secret Service agents, dozens of campaign staffers are now quarantined after positive tests. And then in Arizona, one of the hardest hit states, 
you packed a church with young people who weren't wearing masks. So how can you say that the campaign is not part of the problem that Dr. Fauci laid out? Well, I, I want to remind you again that the freedom of speech and the right to peaceably assemble is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and even in a health crisis, the American people don't forfeit our constitutional rights. Dr. Anthony Fauci is urging Americans to wear masks, but when pressed, Pence refused to echo that call. Tonight, his predecessor, former Vice President Dick Cheney, with a different message. His daughter, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, tweeting this picture with the hashtag, real men wear masks. And Mary Bruce joins us now live from the White House. Mary, even as the pandemic rages here at home overnight, the Trump administration asking the Supreme Court to overturn Obamacare, the health care of more than 20 million Americans now hanging in the balance. Cecilia, in the midst of this pandemic and with millions of Americans recently unemployed, the Trump administration is now formally asking the Supreme Court to overturn Obamacare. If successful, it means that up to 23 million Americans could lose their coverage. And right now, President Trump does not have a plan to replace it. Joe Biden has called this lawsuit heartless, callous, and cruel, and it is certain to reignite the health care debate as we head into the election. Cecilia, a huge fight ahead indeed, Mayor. Climbing cases comes long lines for testing in some areas, people now waiting up to 13 hours. And now this, the percentage of those tests coming back positive is on the rise in 29 states. Health officials warning we may not be ready for what comes next. Here's ABC's Matt Gutman. Testing tonight nationwide, failing to keep up with those surging COVID cases. In Florida, where cases hit that record, nearly 9,000. Yeah, I've been here since 5 o'clock in the morning. Gridlock at Miami's Hard Rock Stadium. Hundreds idling in cars just waiting for that quick swamp. I'm worried about it. I'm worried about it. In Arizona, where demand for tests has almost tripled miles long lines in blistering heat. We are outrunning our ability to test appropriately and test at the capacity that we would all like. And of the state's tests, nearly one in four coming back positive, meaning the virus is running rampant. In this largely Hispanic neighborhood in Phoenix, home to a high number of essential workers, one of the highest infection rates. Some here waiting for up to 13 hours to get to. And then in Arizona, one of the hardest hit states, you packed a church with young people who weren't wearing masks. So how can you say that the campaign is not part of the problem that Dr. Fauci laid out? Well, I, I want to remind you again that the freedom of speech and the right to peaceably assemble is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and even in a health crisis, the American people don't forfeit our constitutional rights. The vice president was also asked if Americans should expect the number of deaths to increase. I just encourage uh, every American to continue to pray. After Vice President Pence showed up to that briefing without a mask, Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney tweeted out a picture of her father, former Vice President Dick Cheney, wearing a mask, and she included the hashtag, real men wear masks. Nora? I think they call that throwing shade. Paula Reed at the White House tonight, thank you. Two people were killed today, a third person wounded in a workplace shooting in Springfield, Illinois. The suspect flew back positive, each person would then be tested individually. Pooling would give us the capacity to go from a half a million tests a day to potentially five million individuals tested today. Philia, scientists tell us we're in the midst of a public health failure to meet the need for testing. And even the CDC itself estimates that up to 10 times more people in the community have COVID than has previously been reported. Cecilia. A sobering number. Okay, Matt, thank you. And despite these anxious times, Americans are taking to the air once again. And that means the airlines are now adding flights. Two major carriers say they will begin booking at full capacity, including those middle seats. But is it safe? Here's Gio Benitez. Tonight, two major airlines are saying goodbye to those empty middle seats. American Airlines and United telling ABC News all seats are up for sale. For United, that's already underway. For American, that begins July 1st. This, as passenger numbers Thursday reached their highest level since mid-March. Why now? American pointing to its cleaning procedures, HEPA air filters, mask policy, and notifications to customers. For months, the two airlines have faced tough criticism after images like these showing crowded planes went viral on social media. Dr. Ethan Weiss's photo aboard a United flight in May triggered the airline to alert passengers of crowded flights in advance. 
I'm probably more likely to get infected there than I would be in the ICU. Other airlines standing firm on their policies. Delta and Southwest blocking middle seats through September 30th. JetBlue through July 30th. And Cecilia, tonight both American and United say that if you don't feel comfortable on a plane, you can change your ticket for free. Cecilia. Okay, Gio, thank you. And tonight, breaking news, we have just learned the European Union will ban travelers from America, saying the virus is not sufficiently under control here. Here's ABC's senior foreign correspondent, Ian Pennell, from London. Tonight, ABC News confirms Americans are set to be banned from Europe, as first reported by the New York Times. The paper, quoting EU officials, says most U.S. citizens will be barred along with other countries considered too risky because they've not controlled the coronavirus outbreak. Even so, the World Health Organization warning of a very significant resurgence of coronavirus in Europe. And Britain's on alert again after these shocking scenes at a south coast beach on Thursday. So crowded, the police declaring a major incident. And in Liverpool, more mass gatherings as soccer fans celebrate a championship title. Now, Prime Minister Boris Johnson warning people must follow the rules, making what appears to be a sideswipe at America. Some parts of it, I won't name them, but you've got spikes, really serious spikes in the incidence of the, of the disease. And here in Britain, those risks only look set to rise when pubs and restaurants reopen next weekend. Cecilia? Okay, Ian, thank you. And back here at home now to that hate crime investigation. For George Floyd's killing. Since then, civil rights groups, including the Anti-Defamation League and the NAACP, pushed for an advertising boycott. Verizon and Unilever joined the growing list of companies that announced they would stop buying ads on Facebook. In May, Zuckerberg told Nora why he's been reluctant to censor controversial posts. Um, and, and I think you want to have a pretty high bar for telling people they can't say something. And today, Zuckerberg says there will be exceptions. We're going to uh, start uh, labeling content uh, that, that we find newsworthy uh, that might otherwise violate our policies. Now, the Anti-Defamation League told us that Zuckerberg's moves today are a good start, but they don't come close to meeting their list of demands, so they're going to continue urging companies to boy... One of them sprayed a liquid on her face and neck and then threw a flaming lighter at her, causing the liquid to ignite. Althea, who works as an EMT, drove forward and patted out the flames. Your brain still has that flight or fight response that takes care of you, so I made it home. I called my mom. I went to the, I drove myself to the ER. Madison's mayor calling the incident an absolutely unacceptable crime, saying in a statement, current information suggests this may have been a premeditated crime targeted toward people of color, which makes the incident even more disturbing. Everybody in Madison deserves to feel safe. The FBI now joining the investigation. I don't really have room for hatred or, um, holding grudges. So I hope that if they do see this, that they will make a change for themselves. And Cecilia, this is being investigated as a hate crime. Authorities are now working with federal investigators combing through all those surveillance cameras, hoping for any clues. Cecilia? Okay, Alex, thank you. And there is still much more ahead on World News tonight this Friday, tracking severe weather in the Northeast and dust cloud triggering at that. Do I? Massimo, to get called Peroni's disease. Try Crest Proactive Defense. It neutralizes back. I want to thank from the entertainment world, brother, beloved, stand up brother, brother Ludacris. What did it mean to you to, to be there and what are you reflecting on as, as that case and these other bills move forward? Um, it was extremely intense being there, and it was great for me to pay my respects and, you know, to, to learn as much as I could because we were also able to talk to George Floyd's family. We were uh, able to understand more about the human being that he was, which was great, and try to, you know, admire them for their strength. And, you know, we were there to try and help them out and give them even more strength, and they gave us even more strength back for us to continue this fight and go back to our cities and do everything in our power besides what we're already doing. Uh, and that's what was most important. It was, it was very great to be there, 100%. Hmm. Uh, that's, I'm sure, very meaningful to a lot of people. 
uh, and Michael, this public grieving is important. It's a grim, tragic milestone uh, that this is called a George Floyd bill uh, because he didn't have to die, according to so many people we've, and experts we talked to. But talk to us about that piece of this history. Well, first of all, I want to say Ludacris is being very charmingly modest about his role in this, but historians are going to study this last month for a very long time. This, we're in many ways living in a different society because of the protests that occurred over the last four months. And at so many of those most important protests, Ludacris's work provided the soundtrack and motivation for a lot of the people who were out there trying to change this country. But that's something, you know, in history, unfortunately, oftentimes it takes a tragedy to open people's eyes. Uh, Birmingham, 1963, those horrible pictures of those barking dogs being set on black demonstrators or 1965 with John Lewis and others on the Edna's Pettus Bridge were almost killed, opened the eyes of a lot of people who should have known better already to the need for civil rights and voting rights. So if there's anything that is going to in any way, in a little way, redeem the horrible tragedy that occurred to George Floyd and through that to all of us, it is that this society changes and other people don't have to suffer. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate the context on that uh, when we think of the other examples and precedents. And we want to get to a point uh, where it hopefully does not require uh, so much to go wrong to have change. Uh, Ludacris, you are working on this new project, Kid Nation. We want to hear about it. I want to play a little bit of uh, some of what you're doing, uh, educating and connecting people of all ages and children. Uh, let's take a look. These are tough issues for adults, let alone children, let alone uh, the extra burden on minority children. Uh, tell us about your project. Man, I want to inspire, I want to uh, uplift, I want to just enrich the new generation as much as I possibly can so that they don't have to go through some of the things that we're going through right now. And it's extremely important for me, obviously, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So I want to use my my, my platform to develop this type of platform because parents are going through a hard time right now. It's a lot of homeschooling. There's a lot of things going on. What better time and what better way than to give them something to help in, you know, just reinforcing positive and uplifting, enriching content for their kids and giving them a safe place to do so and to open up conversations like the ones you were just talking about. Um, you know, the COVID cases are going up. We have a video and song up there called Stay Clean, talking about hygiene. And we also have that Get Along song that's bringing people to tears on KidNation.com. So we are just appreciating the overwhelming response and all of the love that we're receiving. Because at the end of the day, you know, I always say hate may win some battles, but love wins in the end. So I'm trying to make sure I preach love. Hmm. Well, I mean, you are a very talented storyteller. So you turning those talents, that power to children, and as you mentioned, people are at home figuring out how to do this. I guess I got to ask, uh, Luda, if this is sort of like Sesame Street meets word of mouth. <laughs> this is like Kid Nation uh, meets Kid Nation. I, I literally, once people, are able to, <laughs> once people are able to see what we're doing, I think they're going to realize that this is something the world does not have, and the best way for me to describe it is that we as parents all know that there is so much adult content, even if it's censored, that kids mostly like to listen to, right? However, we don't have kids' music that parents and adults actually love to listen to over and over again as well. So I think, right, what we're doing with KidNation.com is creating something that does not exist, and that's why it's been so overwhelming with the responses that we've gotten so far. In hospital together at home. Mayors in this committee and in a working group on police reform and racial justice uh, that we we'll present today. I look forward. But we do have the tools to kill the virus. Testing, 
tracing, treatment, separation, mask, sanitation, and in our bill, we have the resources to do so, and they respect the role that the states play in all of this. So um, uh, I'm hoping that the Grim Reaper will not be responsible for even more uh, dangerous behavior that causes more deaths in our country because we've ignored science. We haven't acted in an evidence-based way. Can't help but say that on this, in this election in November, science, 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 and science are going to be on the ballot. That is what is at stake here. And it's a matter of life and death. With that, I'd be pleased to take any questions. Good evening, I'm Kelsey Passel. Glad to have you with us tonight here at 6 o'clock. I'm Brian Allen. Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County public safety officials now have a new tool when fighting crime or saving lives. The police and fire departments, along with the sheriff's office, will be sharing two drones that they've purchased through a grant. Jacob Sersosimo with our 6 o'clock top story. Whether it be a water rescue or a structure fire. Lee Zurich, we're your watchdog. Download investigate. This the CNN special report, Trump and the law after impeachment. It's hosted by our own Jake Tapper. It's Sunday night. Makes a reporter loud bang, you cannot shoot her off as he falls. A timely reminder as people in South Dakota prepare for their 4th of July fireworks displays. Plus, people in Kingsbury County woke up to flooded roads. We'll show you all of your local news stories, weather forecasts, and sport highlights. Go to the... One week closer. Brett, thank you very much. You too. So good evening everybody, I'm Martha McCallum and this is The Story. Something has shifted in America, as Peggy Noonan writes today. Months of fear, sickness and economic earthquake simply just don't live. Drinking at bars as it breaks its single day record. Meantime, California surpassing 200,000 cases. In Arizona, doctors warning one county's cases are eclipsing New York City boroughs at the height of the crisis there. The state fairgrounds now a massive testing site. The first coronavirus task force briefing in 60 days, despite record spikes. Vice President Pence saying the U.S. has flattened the curve and what he said about masks and President Trump's rallies. Growing outrage over this disturbing video, police restraining an unarmed man in his final moments pleading, I can't breathe. Newly obtained surveillance footage of Elijah McClain, the events right before police put him in a chokehold, and the officers involved. What has now happened? Alarming news if you're working from home, why you may be a target of Russian hackers. The major U.S. airlines announcing they'll begin booking full flights without social distancing, and the five-year-old going the extra mile, and the 100-year-old who inspired him. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, I'm Kristen Welker, in tonight for Lester. We begin with the troubling surge of COVID-19 cases, more than half of states now seeing increases. Governors in Texas and Florida making moves they had hoped to avoid, rolling back reopenings, restricting bars as cases among young people skyrocket. And under pressure to do more, the Coronavirus Task Force held a briefing for the first time in two months, with Vice President Pence saying there's encouraging news, despite the dire picture painted by the numbers. We have it all covered, starting with Sam Brock in Houston. After reopening restaurants and bars just last month, tonight a full-scale about-face in Texas and Florida. The Sunshine State suspending alcohol consumption inside bars after setting a record for daily cases, nearly 9,000. And a bigger pullback in Texas, the governor closing down all bars and bringing restaurant capacity back to 50%. Officials from Houston to Austin raising the alarm. We find ourselves careening toward a catastrophic and unsustainable situation. This is crunch time for us. We, we need everybody to religiously uh, wear their masks and to social distance. For one restaurant and bar owner in the Lone Star State, closed this week because an employee contracted COVID, it was about time. What was your reaction to the governor's decision? I think the decision was correct. I think right now we all have to get on the same page because if we don't get on the same page, it's going to just get more and more and more. 
Across town, another business making changes. The Kalachi factory has locations all over Houston. Recently, they brought back in-room dining, only to take them away and replace tables with social distancing cues well before the governor's mandate. The fears here, not only about health. What is your greatest concern at this point? Uh, my greatest concern is that we'll have to start laying off people. Houston, now at 100% capacity for ICU beds, and doctors in East Texas reporting problems there, too. To tell them, I'm just having trouble finding somebody to accept your loved one. There's nothing I can say to make those feelings better. Today, the White House Coronavirus Task Force announcing the overwhelming majority of new cases are among young people not taking precautions, who likely won't get seriously ill, but will spread the virus. You will infect someone else, who clearly will infect someone else. We know that happens. Ultimately, you will infect someone who's vulnerable. 21-year-old Adriana Carter recently contracted COVID just days after a night out at a bar without a mask. Now, her message. Just because you are a healthy 20-something-year-old does not mean you cannot be a carrier and give it off to others. A sharp reminder that could be the difference in the urgent fight for containment. Sam Brock, NBC News, Houston. I'm Joe Fryer in Arizona, where new cases today again topped 3,000 as Governor Doug Ducey pleads with residents when a reporter asked about the fact that masks have become this political issue, he then only told people that they should be following local or state guidance, ignoring the fact that the CDC, a federal agency of course, has recommended that people wear masks when they are out in public and within the vicinity of other people. He also defended those rallies that he and the president have been holding and encouraging their supporters to come to where thousands of people are put indoors with very little social distancing, Aaron, by saying that it was people's right to the First Amendment, characterizing it more as a personal decision than something that they're organizing and urging people to come and to attend. But I do want to note, you know, two of the most striking things that came out of that briefing today was the vice president offering a pretty rosy assessment of these numbers and then Dr. Fauci getting up there and having a very sobering warning about what's to come and personal responsibility in this. But also, Aaron, the vice president saying he believed it's inarguable that the reason that there are more cases in the United States is because there's more testing. Dr. Burks got up and she was going through these slides and one of the ones she pointed to was of Texas where it showed in May as they were increasing testing, their positive test rates were going down. In the last two and a half weeks, they've continued to increase testing but now those positive test rates Aaron are going up and that completely refutes what the president and the vice president have been telling people and governors right. for the last several weeks all right thank you very much Caitlin absolutely makes the crucial point right uh, the percent test rate in which Donald Trump won is the first Republican to win it since 1984 last time. Hillary all but ignored it. The methodology the New York Times used this time was fundamentally different. The Republican versus Democratic self-identification was one point different last time. Now it was plus seven Democratic. That's important, Martha, because if you're a Democrat, you're going to be over 85, 90 percent for Joe Biden. Same thing with Republicans. So if your sample is seven points shy of what it was last time, right. that's going to affect the polls. But Joe Biden is not above 50 percent right. for a very so significant reason. He hasn't made a compelling case. All right, so you're Why saying you don't believe these to polls. Invite more disruption. No, I didn't say that, Martha. I did not say that. I just said the polls are where I would expect them to be right now, but that we have to look at the methodology. Okay. The polls are where they were when I took over as campaign manager in August 2016 in this way. Both Hillary and Trump and Biden and Trump are usually below 50 percent and within a few points of each other in these states. I expect that. Now, in terms of the president making a connection, you know, he's the one out there every single day. He's the most transparent, available president. And I think when people look at the progress he's worked and hear his vision for the future, he should go out. I, I think he should hold peace talks at Camp David. Why not? Domestic peace talks. I'm all for the president addressing this, but he has again and again. He addressed George Floyd's murder for the first time down at NASA got very little coverage. Uh, people just always want it to be the word and the semicolon where they think it should be, where you have to look at what we're trying to do to bring the country together. Listen, we are founded on and liberty and justice for all, but the words that precede that are important too. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we're trying to focus on all Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. So I, 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 I think the president should present himself as a health care president. 
Yes, he should present himself as a healthcare president, jobs, not mobs. He should talk about that he built an economy that allowed us to sustain all through the global pandemic that we are still dealing with in some of these states. But that we, that's why we made the mm -hmm. coronavirus task force available today for about an hour and a half press briefing. So we're out there. I think Joe Biden, they've never seen a golf in exposure between two presidential nominees. We get about a total of less than an hour a, a week of Joe Biden and we get Donald Trump all day long, I think Biden should be at 70% yeah. because you can make him whatever you want him to be. He showed up in Philly yesterday, which basically is his home area. It's where his campaign is nationally headquartered. And you would have thought it was a Trump right. appearance because there were more Trump signs than there were Biden signs. The enthusiasm is for Trump and people don't want to invite more disruption right, and change in a system that has so much of it now. All right, so, so, you know, one of the things that the Wall Street Journal points out is approval number, which is, is obviously different from the head-to-head -head polls. Um, it says Mr. Trump refuses to acknowledge what every poll now says is true. His approval rating has fallen below 40%. Um, 40% or below, I should say. That is George H.W. Bush and Jimmy Carter territory. They're the last two presidents to be denied a second term. As a you know, career pollster, does the approval number give you concern when compared to those two former presidents? I would expect a president's approval rating to be lower than normal when we are in so many crises in this country. That doesn't surprise me at all. People want to point the finger somewhere. Okay. And uh, they certainly are pointing at Congress. Congress's approval rating is basically half of that. And I think it's because people see they don't even show That's up true. to work. They're not working with us. Um, secondly, Martha, do you know what Donald Trump's approval rating was on the night he got elected president? Right about 40%, maybe 41, 42, but it was right in there. So his, you know, his, his electoral take is a good eight, nine, 10 points higher than the approval rating. I wrote a piece 18 years ago called The Unbearable Lightness of Approval Ratings, and Donald Trump was a successful billionaire businessman, so I wasn't talking about him. I was talking about how the more... ...and the police use of excessive force, that's why it requires a national solution. Uh, not a piecemeal approach, which is what Senator Scott seems to want to do by trying to incentivize this department in one area or that department in another area, uh, but not necessarily mandate things across the board, such as a national use of force standard that emphasizes de-escalation tactics in the first instance and the use of deadly force only as a matter of last resort or national data. So they're making the argument that it's not constitutional. They're, and as you know very well, there's also criticism, as we just said, that for many Americans, the premiums are still too high. Uh, how do, what's the answer to that? Well, look, there is plenty to not like about our health care system. Uh, and no one law, whether it's the ACA or any other law, is going to fix it all. Uh, what we need to do is keep improving our health care system and making